Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the astrological forecast for the entire year ahead of 2021. So joining me today are astrologers Kelly Surtees and Austin Kopic. Hey guys, welcome. Welcome aboard. Hi. Hey, Chris. Thank you for joining me today. We have a live audience of over 200 patrons who are joining us, so thanks to everybody who's in the audience. This is episode 284 of the Astrology Podcast. We're recording it on Thursday, December, or sorry, Friday, December 18th, uh, 2020, starting at 11:35 a.m. in Denver, Colorado. Uh, so, the structure of this episode, especially for those listening or just watching it on YouTube, is we're going to spend the first 40 minutes doing kind of an overview and talking about some of the major uh, points, three especially major points about the astrology of 2021. Then we're going to transition into doing a quarter by quarter analysis of 2021, uh, breaking up the year into three month chunks, and then talking about what the major highlights are for each of the next 12 months. Then eventually we'll do a sort of conclusion and wrap it up. We're shooting for a three hour episode in order to do really a deep dive into this topic, although I'll put some timestamps uh, eventually on the YouTube version and on the audio version on the podcast website for those that want to jump around. All right, I think that's the good introductory stuff. So first, uh, round of applause, I think, uh, both to us and everybody that we have just about made it through tw- the year of 2020. So c- congratulations. Um, you know, we did our forecast last year in November of 2019, and we knew it was going to be a big year. Um, but I think I think it definitely ended up meeting expectations. What What do you guys think? Yeah, I think that um, <laughs> saying that we thought it would be a big year was uh, is under underselling it a little bit, or perhaps uh, sugarcoating it. Um, you know, we thought it was going to be a shit year. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because <laughs> our our discussions it, about that met were expectations, like, right? And it's funny because our pre discussions about that because we all met up here in Denver and we actually prepared for that episode. Luckily, that forecast last year much more than usual. Uh, and did a relatively good job, but one of the debates that we were having amongst ourselves were like was how to how to how much to tell people and how seriously to put this sort of you know um, the news to give the bad news that 2020 was going to be a rough year versus how much to hold back. And we didn't really hold back too much, I don't think. But it's funny in retrospect having had that discussion and interesting as we're going into 2021. Because I think we, even though there's still some seriously rocky points about 2021, there's um, some higher notes of optimism. It seemed like we all agreed than last year in some places, right? Yeah, yes. it's um, it's a it's a it's a mixed bag, which is a huge improvement. Yeah, optimism, Kelly. Was that, or do you have some things you're optimistic about? Yeah, look, I think I. There are some things to remain cautious about in 2021, but there are more things to be maybe hopeful or welcoming of. Um, I'm not sure if that's quite the right words, but yeah, there's there's a couple of planetary cycles that I think are going to be much nicer than anything we had in 2020. Yeah. Okay. So let's see here. First, I wanted to share an image. This is um, designed by our Graphic artist and astrologer Paula Bellomini. Uh, this is a, just an image that shows where the planets will start at the beginning of the year, and then how far through the signs of the zodiac they'll get by the end of the year, including their different retrograde cycles during the course of it. So this is one of the posters that we just released on the Astrology Podcast website. But it's nice to like get a, a sort of snapshot of where all the planets will be over the course of the next twelve months. Um, one of the things that we need to talk about that's happening right now in the next few days as we're recording this, but that's still going to, the energy is going to carry forward into next year, is the Jupiter Saturn conjunction that's actually taking place in Aquarius in the next few days on the 21st of December, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah. So, right on the solstice. And and this is something that you, if you go outside right now, you can visually see these two planets where there's these bright little twinkling stars that are lined up right next to each other. And I know a few nights ago when Saturn went into Aquarius, the moon actually caught up and conjoined both of them that very night, which was a really 
striking sort of visceral thing to see in terms of a, a planetary alignment happening in the sky. And I think we could all feel that energy um, sort of culminating in a sense, which was interesting at the very end of 2020. But maybe we should talk about how that's going to lead us through into 2021. Yeah, the Jupiter Saturn conjunction with that air signature. Yeah, so in in the air sign of Aquarius. So Aquarius is a fixed sign. Um, it's a quote unquote, you know, masculine sign in ancient astrology, or Austin, you say a, a yin sign, right? Uh, that would be young. Young. Okay. Sorry. That's I. Yeah. Um, hey, and okay. There are there are two. Is one of them. It's one of the two. You can be 50-50. Um, and it's a Saturn ruled sign in traditional astrology. So let's talk a little bit about that. If Aquarius is one of the main signatures that's in this year, because it's not just that that Saturn Jupiter con conjunction happens in December, but also Saturn and Jupiter then will be transiting through that sign for the entirety of this year. And that's one of the main signatures of 2021. So, what is the energy of, of a Saturn Jupiter conjunction in Aquarius? Well, I think maybe we should back up a half step um, and point out that um, this, uh, this this particular conjunction and Jupiter Saturn conjunctions in general um, are sort of the the tent poles of history in are one of the tent poles of history in traditional astrology, and that um, this conjunction in as you said Aquarius and Air sign. Um, begins a series of con a series of every twenty year conjunctions in air signs that uh, defines an almost two century period, and so we're we're basically leaving one two century period where the conjunctions were predominantly in earth signs, and then moving into a whole new era, like a multi a two two ish century era where they'll be in air signs, and so. 2020 really was the end of an era, and 2021 really is the beginning of an era, um, and not necessarily in a sort of upward spiral, history always gets better sort of way, but in a more horizontal way, where we're changing from the patterns of Earth to the patterns of air. Yeah, I, I like that. And so the ending of cycles and the beginning of new ones. So it's the ending of both. At the smallest, at the very most local, like an end of a 20 year cycle, because the last time we had a Jupiter Saturn conjunction was in 2000. So you can think of it in that context of opening up a two decade long period of life, but also because it's moving out of a triplicity, it's opening up um, 200 years of conjunctions all in air signs in general. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a substantial shift on so many levels. And so I think. To, to create that context that we're crossing into a new year, it's the start of a, a calendar 12-month period, but energetically or from a cycles perspective, there's a number of other things that are going on that make the transition from 2020 to 2021 more significant and more important perhaps in terms of that reset. You know, we're coming out of 20 years, the last Sat Jupiter-Saturn conjunction was in Taurus, uh, and now we're going into Aquarius. And as Austin, you were saying, that shift from earth themes or earth qualities or an era in time that is kind of infused with earth stuff and going into an era in time. I think it's, yeah, it's just under 200 years where the qualities of air, which has a lot more to do with movement and mobility, to do with dispersion, uh, maybe even decentralization of things. So one of the images that I woke up with this morning thinking about, which is what astrologists do, we just wake up and astrology is always in our, in our brains, was I was thinking about the way the wind blows the sand and creates sand dunes and how over time, mm. you know, over the course of a week or a month, the sand dunes can shift. And over the course of a year or decades, the sand dunes actually move. And that's kind of a hard, maybe it's hard to predict, uh, but you can see it happening. You may not see the wind moving, but you see the sand being in a different place to where it was. So that idea of um, how air or wind moves and changes things uh, is sort of the time frame that we're entering into. I like that. That's a good. Yeah, I like. That's a good metaphor. Yeah, I like the. Uh, I like to use the word. Uh, what is it? Dispersing. Mm. Uh, I have in my notes. I often think of scattering 
the way that yeah. if you have a, a nice pile of leaves raked up yeah. um, and a strong gust of wind comes, it scatters them all over the yard. Yes. That's very same, same thing. Yeah. The other uh, shift from having all of the conjunctions for 200 years in earth signs and moving from earth signs to air signs is um, a feeling of moving from something that's more material or, or tangible to um, digital. And one of the uh, one of the things, one of the episodes that I did earlier this month was on the astrology of Bitcoin, and I'm getting um, reports from friends and, and from the guy that I interviewed earlier this month, Robert Weinstein, that Bitcoin just hit another high and went over twenty thousand dollars for the first time in history in terms of its value. So all of a sudden, Saturn has just shifted into Aquarius, and Jupiter and Saturn are conjoining in the early. Um, Early degrees of that sign in the next few days, and all of a sudden there's this digital currency that doesn't have any material sort of value, like let's say gold or silver or something like that. It doesn't start as a physical essence. It starts as something that is more abstract or, or digital as a currency, and yet um, that currency is like rising to be very valuable at this point in time. And I think that's a really interesting metaphor for this period that we're moving into. Yeah, um, th there's uh, how should we say things being ungrounded is certainly mm -hmm. a theme, um, and grounding can be good. Grounding can be rooting, um, but grounding can also be um, trapping or being tied mm -hmm. to something. Um, I think in general, um, if we're looking at Earth versus Air periods of history. Um, we're we're look one one useful uh, angle of investigation is <clears throat> uh, social organization and the organization of civilizations. And Earth is very like heavy, uh, heavy pyramidal shapes, right? Where we have hierarchies. You've got to stack things on top of each other, right? Pyramids are the first. Um, it's sort of the first tall thing that you can make, right? Mm. Is you just keep stacking. Um, and so it's a little, we're kind of, uh, there's a movement away from heavy hierarchy and towards network, um, which is more horizontal, mm. um, but also much more unstable. You know, historically, um, historically, the air periods are unstable, right? And instability is is a boon if you are trapped in a stable system that you hated, right? But um, just like uh, you know, it, it's the, this question um, and issue of structure, right? Structure can be uh, can be a trap, can be a prison, but structure is also shelter, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're we're getting a much more shifty, not as reliable structure, and that's great in some ways, um, but that's that also exposes us to risk in other ways. And you know, obviously, this is two hundred years for the whole world. So we can't just say, oh, and it's this one thing. This is the the background, right? The background is mm. uh, is is wind rather than earth. Mm. Yeah, and and we do get quite a strong introduction, I think, to the quality of the wind in 2021. If we like come back to 2021, it's the start of this longer cycle. But we have Saturn and Jupiter together in Aquarius all year. And we'll also have the Mercury retrogrades in air signs for 2021, which just adds another quality of emphasis in the air element, if you like. So there's going to be, and we'll talk about more of that when we get into our quarterly overviews, but that idea that we're getting this real sense of what is it like to live in a, a wind or an air era versus living in this anchored earth, a stable structured kind of quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like um, what was said about the increasing value of like the social uh, and social spheres as well as intellectual spheres. One of the things we saw in, in the first quarter and second quarter of 2021 that was a preview when Saturn first went into Aquarius was during the worldwide um, lockdowns due to the pandemic, everybody all of a sudden was only able to connect and was connecting through the internet and through things like Zoom, like we're using right now, through um, you know online webinars and things like that, and there was a lot of innovation and a lot of um, you know attempts to push to be social 
and do what you could socially through digital means. And the fact that that was kind of a preview of Saturn and Aquarius, I think, is going to become somehow more important or more relevant as we get further into the first full year of Saturn and Aquarius in 2021, and perhaps as a broader theme for this whole cycle that Saturn and Jupiter are starting right now. Um, but since that was happening, or that started under a Mars Saturn conjunction, which is a little bit more negative, a little bit more oppressive, I'm looking f- forward to the more optimistic side of that with Saturn and Jupiter now conjoining in Aquarius this, this week and, and over the course of this year. Um, yeah, definitely. So here's the image of that just with December of 2020. And Saturn went into Aquarius on the 17th of December, Jupiter into Aquarius on the 19th, which is today, or tomorrow, I should say. And then the Saturn Jupiter conjunction taking place at 21 degrees or on the 21st of December here uh, coming up. So, what I think one more thing um, that we should just mention about the Jupiter Saturn being an, an epochal shift is that um, in the mundane astrological tradition where we get the Jupiter Saturn as a yardstick of history. Um, we also get texts saying that years um, years that have that conjunction are actually not good, uh, or that there's a uh, that they're well, not that they're not good, but that there there is a difficulty there that um, on a small scale basis um, that a Jupiter Saturn conjunction is unfortunate, and I think what uh, I think what that is pointing to is the difficulty of making shifts and changing mm. patterns. Even um, even if we were to imagine that um, the next pattern um, or set of patterns, the the next uh, environmental pattern uh, would be much more positive. Regearing in and of itself takes a lot of time and energy out of the day, right? It's almost um, like how we think of cadent houses, right? It just takes all you got. There are a lot of problems to solve. Figuring out one, you know, having to remap. Your environment takes time, and then once you've remapped the environment, then you have to figure out the. Then you have to um, rethink your path through the new environment, and so there, there is. Uh, that's an energy-intensive uh, and mind-intensive process. Problem. Also, to institutions solve. in the world don't pivot and change very swiftly, right? No. Yeah, change is, is slow. And I like that keyword of, or that phrase of problems to solve, because um, that makes me think of Saturn, Jupiter, and Aquarius, and especially like problems to solve through technology. So, for example, coming out of this pandemic year, and one of the things that's happening right at the end of it, so close to that Saturn Jupiter conjunction, is all of a sudden the new vaccine, COVID vaccines are being rolled out worldwide. And it's something that was developed rapidly in order to attempt to solve something that had just brought the world to a complete halt at different points during 2020. Um, So maybe that's a broader theme that we might be looking at in the long term, which is attempts to solve problems through technology and some of the ways that that either becomes helpful or sometimes um, issues come up in the process of trying to implement that. Mm. Yeah, I think we can see a need to pivot dramatically um, and swiftly um, in almost every sphere, right? Right. It, um, for a lot of people, it's literally, what are you, what are you going to do for work? Mm. Right. Well, and the individual can pivot or adapt faster than a larger organization that's quite entrenched or has embedded systemic, you know, structures or protocols, for instance. So, I think that speaks to your point, Austin, about how it takes time to update your map, both practically and internally, when we go through such a substantial shift. And, you know, at an individual level versus at a organizational level, the pace of that updating will be different. And that's why sometimes these rollouts of this this major structural shift, like this tentpole in history, if you like, astrologically, can take many years to really uh, make itself known or make manifest those changes because when you're trying to bring that change down through an organization or a structure or a system, it does require um, a lot of many small steps and changes along the way. 
That's a really good point. So, I, I remember in like ancient electional texts, they say fixed signs like Aquarius are really slow to get started, but once they if they do successfully get moving, they can be long lasting once something is initiated. And with the Saturn Jupiter conjunction, we're of course talking about the end of a long cycle and the opening up or the laying of seeds for a new one. Yeah, it's it's the end of the world as we know it. And I feel deeply ambivalent. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that at uh, one point? Is, that's our working the, title for this year. Deeply ambivalent. Yeah, that's that's my misquoting of that that REM song. Um, okay. I, I want to go back to something you said, Kelly, about the the wind shaping the Earth. I think those are called Aeolian patterns. Um, but I was just thinking from a mapping perspective, there's there's not only the territory which is reshaped by the wind currents, mm. but uh, if we're just going to carry this earth to air metaphor a little further, the the most relevant set of data or map might be a map of weather patterns and wind currents rather than a topographical map. Of the, right? of the like land height, itself. Height and depth and the, the texture of the soil is very relevant when you live in the soil, but when you live in the air, the the wind currents that that shifting map of currents might be more relevant. Just yeah, it's like thinking about what a pilot needs versus what a farmer needs, essentially. Mm, mm-hmm. um, take a look at this diagram I got from archetypalexplorer.com yesterday, and our friend Kyle, who runs Archetypal Explorer, which. I really love as a program. It shows you, it can show you, you can put in whatever transits you want. But one of the features it has is showing long term mundane outer planet transits and when they go exact versus when they start to subside and the planets move away from the exact aspect. And when you plot some of that major outer planet stuff happening in late 2020 and early 2021, you get this weird nexus of overlapping transits. That are either starting or ending or culminating at this point in um, mid to late December of 2020, and I haven't seen anything else like this. Just just really emphasizes how much of a sort of nexus in time this is that we're at right now, as well as a sort of turning point where it's clearly ending some cycles, but then starting to really ramp up other cycles. That's a yeah, great that, diagram. The way that it it maps that. Complicated crossroads uh, is pretty nice. Yeah, well, that that's a great keyword. Complicated crossroads would be a mm-hmm. good keyword for where we're at right now. Um, so the Jupiter Saturn conjunction culminating. We're coming out of the Jupiter Pluto conjunctions, the series of three, which we've uh, luckily just finally f- almost completed. Um, Here's some updated like graphs with like currently hospitalized people in the US with COVID and how that ended up mapping out in retrospect with the Jupiter Pluto conjunctions, at least in the US and to some extent worldwide over the course of the past year, which has just been stunning to see. Um, then we have some new cycles that are going to start that we haven't experienced yet, like Jupiter uh, square Uranus going exact in January, Saturn square Uranus. Exact in February, um, the Saturn Pluto cycle uh, ending finally. Thank God that was kind of a rough, rough transit. Um, yeah, yeah, that was that was actually. Uh, I'll let you finish, but there was something I wanted to to drill down on there. No, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say it's really. Um, so one of the themes for this year and the next year is Saturn square Uranus. Um, however, I think it's really important to contextualize that. Um, with where we've been. So for the last two, almost three years, um, we've been doing Saturn Pluto increasingly tight, right? Mm-hmm. And Saturn Pluto, so if Saturn, Saturn is structure, organization, law, et cetera, et cetera, Pluto takes that to um, an extreme level, um, where as uh, you, I believe you and I and Patrick discussed years ago, you get things like famous prisons being built. You get the the structure of Saturn becomes um, uh, uh, brutal and despotic, right? And so we've had Saturn, in a sense, over intensified by Pluto for a while, right? And mm-hmm. we're not just not only do, are we losing that. Um, you know, fare thee well. Um, <laughs> but we're also we're getting um, what is in many ways 
a completely opposite influence, we're getting Saturn configured to Uranus, right? Where whereas Pluto, um, in a, a Pluto kind of corrupts and intensifies the structuring action of Saturn. Um, Uranus, uh, Uranus throws into question whatever structures are proposed, right? Mm-hmm. Uranus is like, yeah. Well, maybe no structure would be better. Or yeah, what if we did it this way? Yeah, what if we did it a new way? Um, it is, um, yeah, it, it's it's a questioning, and I would say challenging uh, of Saturn consistently, rather than that that corrupt intensification we saw with Pluto, and that that's a huge part of just the atmosphere of the next two years and even the next two months. Yeah, that's a great great point and great transition into talking about Saturn square Uranus, which is our major outer planet signature, or one of the main outer planet signatures over the course that goes exact three times over the course of 2021. Um, Here's another diagram from Kyle at Archetypal Explorer, where in 2020, earlier in the year in the first or second quarter, it kind of got close when Saturn dipped into uh, early Aquarius. But Saturn and Uranus didn't get close enough to make an exact aspect, but in February, we get our first exact square between Saturn and Uranus from Saturn at 7 Aquarius to Uranus at 7 degrees of Taurus. Then it retro- then it keeps going, then eventually retrogrades and comes back. There's another square on June 14th at 13 Aquarius to 13 Taurus, and then finally one more exact one that occurs on December 24th of 2021. Uh, from Saturn at 11 Aquarius to Uranus at 11 Taurus. Um, We do have some return of Saturn-Uranus the following year in 2022, so we're not completely out of the woods, but um, it never goes exact again after 2021. So I think that's a good thing to keep focused on in terms of one of the main uh, keywords and one of the main signatures for 2021. Yeah, it's... um I think a lot of and and as we as we plan to get into in the quarterly overview, a lot of um twenty twenty ones can we just call it twenty one? Um twenty one. <laughs> it's a bit Feels of a like mouthful, we're using too it? many syllables. Yeah. Yeah. Um but a, a lot a lot of the most interesting and dramatic uh configurations of twenty one and twenty two um are anchored to that Saturn Uranus square. So I think as a like setting up a theme, it is probably good to lay out that what you've just said, Chris, about the exact dates for 2021 with Saturn Square Uranus. But as a tone or a theme or this kind of background cycle, although it'll be very much in the foreground in 2021, Saturn Uranus, we're doing that for the next two years, really. Like yeah. That's that is the theme of the next two years. Yeah. If the if the 1920s was like the roaring 1920s, then the early 2020s with Saturn square Uranus is like the the rebellious 2020s, is one That's of my nice. one yeah. of my phrases. Yeah, yeah. it is. I, there is this sort of radical reshaping or questioning or pushing back. I mean, these are very strong and different symbols when we think about Saturn versus Uranus. So to have a sense of that idea, and I loved how you put it into context, Austin, around. You know, Saturn Uranus is is a strong signature regardless, but relative to what we've just had, which is three years of Saturn yeah. Pluto co present, it's very very different because Saturn is sort of, you know, Uranus pushes Saturn to to break apart or to update or to modernize or, you know, to to come into the now rather than to hold on to the past uh, and to maybe disperse some of the structure or or even the the power. So it, it's really going to be a very different tone, and it'll run through the next couple of years. Yeah, one of the previews we had early last year when Saturn went into Aquarius and started squaring Uranus was there were two waves of sort of protests, at least in the United States, that might give us some clue about some of the types of things we might see in the future. The first wave was initially, it seemed like um, there was some pushback, especially in the more conservative quarters against the lockdowns and people wanting to sort of rebel against what they viewed as government overreach um, in trying to keep people at home during the course of the pandemic to 
stem the, the the spread of the pandemic and of the virus. And so the first wave of protests with Saturn and Aquarius last year was a bit of that, was like sort of anti-government type protests. And then the second wave um, was in June, was more of the social protests um, after the murder of George Floyd and um, and a lot of people wanting to seek social justice and, and equality, um, especially for Black people in the United States, and that became um, an even stronger sort of signature as we went into June with Saturn still still in Aquarius, and I think it stationed sometime around that time, right? Uh, I think it was it. Yeah, I think it's maybe station. I don't remember when it's stationed, but it it went back into Capricorn at the very beginning of July. Beginning but, of July. But um, I, I yeah. think that that shows us something about. So you're you're in a square Saturn. Um, is uh, I guess the the play term is civil unrest, right? But it's it's demonstration, it's public demonstration, public discontent, and it's not particularly partisan, right? Like it, in our preview period, um, we saw two very different protest movements, and um, you know and that's just within the United States where we divide everything neatly into two. Um, but you know, there's you know there are protests in Europe. Um, India right now is having one of the largest protests in mm -hmm. history. Um, and so it's going to hit different, um, states and nations and continents differently, but it's, it's, um, it's unrest. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's Uranus. Uranus is, Uranus wants, Uranus is very ideal, uh, or excuse me, ideal, uh, idealistic, um, and is willing to, um, is willing to contend in order to, um, either make something that doesn't get close enough to the ideal go away or to improve it. Um, but it's uh, Uranus's approach to Saturn is th uh, this isn't good enough. Um, and but it's this isn't good enough in an active disruptive way. It's not um, it's not like a, I don't love it, but I'm gonna go over here now, right? It's not uh, it's not passive. Mm. Yeah. Um, are there any other Saturn, Uranus core keywords that you can think of, Kelly? That you think about um, that are important here, or you know, another thing that's going to accelerate the Saturn Uranus and emphasize it this year is the fact that it's not just Saturn Uranus on its own, like it was back in the spring and early summer, but also Jupiter is going through Aquarius at the same time, and we'll also have a series of Jupiter Uranus squares. I think this year, right? We will, yes. I mean, it, it does feel that the last couple of years there was the real focus on Pluto. So we had a lot of, you know, Pluto keywords and concepts coming through. And so looking forward, the outer planet that dominates the landscape is very much Uranus. So we always hear about those two keywords of Uranus, uh, revolutions and rebellions. And, you know, these are the kinds of qualities or experiences at both a personal level and a collective level that are starting to gain traction. So the idea of, you know, the um, holding Saturn to a standard or challenging Saturn to to do things differently or to, um, yeah, it is, it's like this radical reshaping of, of things that have been around for a long time. Um, and so one of the other keywords that I often think about for Uranus is the idea of freedom. And that can apply personally, it can apply collectively. And so the idea here is what is what is important in terms of freedom to individuals, but also collectively or within society? And then how do we move forward to create something that reflects that, I guess? Yeah, that and that's. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's. Um, I think one of the simplest things that you can point out with the square between Saturn and Uranus is Saturn is order and safety, and Uranus is liberty, right? Mm -hmm. or, for, or or freedom, right? And that those are those are both important human things, right? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. they uh, they continually come into conflict. Um and. In the audience, uh, Elion uh, points out that there's only one Jupiter Uranus conjunction or square that happens this year that it retrogrades and comes back and becomes close, but only oh, one exact only, hit. Only one exact, yeah, early in the year. Um, so that's actually a really good point. And also points out that 
the Uranus Jupiter square has been important or coincided with important moments in black history, such as the Nat Turner slave rebellion, the Emancipation Proclamation, and other events. So that's a good point as well for additional context um, about you know coming up this year and, and what those important turning points can be when Jupiter joins the party at the same time, in addition to Saturn squaring Uranus. Mm. All right. Yeah, so- I think that I, I would oh. just add that. Um, the the Jupiter square Uranus is a as we say, sort of a, a more constructive moment in the longer Saturn Uranus story. Um, but there's only one, and Jupiter moves on, whereas Saturn does it for a couple years. Um, and we're going to have even more emphasis um, on that Saturn Uranus. Uh, a dynamic in 22 because of the eclipses highlighting it and mm. so and we just have one jupiter early this year but this story goes on for a solid two mm. um and so yes yeah. we can comfortably say jupiter might helpfully intervene briefly but doesn't really get to steer the narrative there I mean, I wonder if that gives this year more potential for you know sudden opportunities for growth and bursts of breaking from the past in ways maybe that are more successful or less um, tense or difficult compared to just like Saturn squaring Uranus on its own once Jupiter leaves that sign and is no longer there to lend sort of a smoothing out or an optimism or um, like a, a stability and confirmation type factor to Saturn's tendency to just reject and negate things. Yeah, I think um, Jupiter being part of that for a while how um, maybe offers um, some more positive, or it, as you say, makes some of the structural reform a little easier, and that that's like a. Uh, a more governmental term, but I, I mean that on a personal level as well, right? Like, what is the structure that we've decided on? Right? There's a lot. There's how we fill the structure, but there's like, I'm going to do this on Fridays and Saturdays, and then this is, you know, I'm going to do this job. I'm going to not do this job. Those are structural, sort of life architectural decisions, and I think Jupiter's participation will make some of that reblueprinting a little, um, a little bit. Easier and also give some good ideas for not just, uh, in a sense, structuring for security, but also structuring, um, uh, 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 you know, a, a building so that it's something that you want to live in, right? Yeah. One of the things this is making me think about, is, of course, is Jupiter works in twelve-year cycles, <clears throat> and so if you take it back twelve years to see what Jupiter in Aquarius was like last time, or if you want to know what Jupiter in Aquarius was like, you look back twelve years. And this was around the time of um, when Obama was first elected in two th- November of 2008, which famously there was an exact Saturn Uranus opposition at that time. And that opposition, one of his main um, campaign keywords was was change, and that it ended up being like the change election, where that theme of change and like Uranus ended up dominating dominating over the more Saturn theme, which tends to be more resistant to change. Um, so that is one signature, but then also by the time he was inaugurated, Jupiter had gone into Aquarius, which was also Obama's rising sign, of course, famously. And one of his famous keywords during his first election was "Yes, yes, we can," or "Yes, we can." So even if you didn't like agree with him politically, like that, and, and regardless of his, you know, successes or failures. Realizing that he had tapped into something in that moment that was kind of like in the airwaves at the time, and that part of that was Jupiter and Aquarius. I think um, again gives us some some previews and some ideas of what this Saturn square Uranus and Jupiter and Aquarius dynamic might be um, going over the course of the next year, especially. Yeah, I think this is um, a somewhat less hopeful uh, edition, but. Yeah, well, we will we will see. All right. Um, the last thing that we needed to touch base on, just to keep things moving, because we're going a little over time, is just um, there's a major shift away from cardinal placements this year, and a shift more towards 
the mutable signs and more towards the fixed signs, which is one of the ways that people might be able to conceptualize how some of these major transits are over the course of 2021 are going to affect them personally or how they're going to co correlate with major changes and shifts in different parts of your life depending on where you have the cardinal signs, the mutable signs, and the fixed signs. So on the one hand, we have a shift away from cardinal signs where we had that huge pileup of planets last year in Capricorn as well as eventually a Mars retrograde in Aries that lasted for six months, or at least Mars's transit through Aries lasted for six months. There were also eclipses that took place on the Cancer-Capricorn axis, so we just had a huge amount of emphasis and tension and kind of tense aspects in the cardinal signs, which was kind of tricky and tough for many people with heavy cardinal placements in their chart, which is Aries, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn. So there's going to be something of an alleviation or at least a moving away of energy from that sector of the signs of the zodiac this year. And the nodal axis and the eclipse series has already started to shift into the mutable signs of Gemini and Sagittarius while um, Saturn and Jupiter moving into Aquarius shifts that focus more towards the fixed signs of Taurus, Leo, uh, Scorpio, and Aquarius. So that's a pretty notable shift that's kind of personalizable, I think, in a way, right? What do you think, Kelly? Yeah, I definitely think that's something <clears throat> that, depending on how much you know about astrology, if you are a fixed sign, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, or Aquarius, you can just kind of understand that you're starting a pretty big two-year cycle. And some fixed signs have already been in a pretty big cycle if they've got early fixed planets to do with Uranus having moved into Taurus. But there will certainly be an increase in intensification or focus or energy. And if you know your own astrology chart, of course, you can look into the houses in your birth chart where you have those four fixed signs, particularly Aquarius, but the other fixed signs as well as topics or areas in your life that do need to be maybe updated or reworked or particularly the Aquarius part of our charts, I think about the restructuring. But as a general shift, yeah, we're, we're moving from a cardinal emphasis, which has been really heavy the past two years, into a fixed sign emphasis. And 2021 brings in a lot of fixed energy straight out of the gate. And as Austin, you mentioned, that increases when we get to 22 as we get the nodes come in to the fixed signs as well. So 2021, I've really conceptualized it as a, a fixed sign year focusing on the air element, which we've talked about. But there is like this side of mutable energy that, that comes up this year, uh, but it is primarily fixed for the year. And here's a diagram for those watching the video version again that shows, um, again made by Paula Bellomini, that shows our eclipses in 2021. So total lunar eclipse in Sagittarius on May 26th, uh, then a solar eclipse in Gemini June 10th. A at the end of the year we get a shift to Taurus, and there is a lunar eclipse on November 19th in Taurus, and then finally a total solar eclipse on December 4th. Um, towards the end of the year. So we can see that shift first. It's in mutable signs all year, and that starts shifting to fixed signs by the end of the year, where it'll continue that that shift into 2022. Yeah. And so we basically we get the in 2022, um, we get the eclipses lining up with the Uranus Saturn. Um, but for most of this year, most of 2021, um, they're going to be separate. And so I would just say in terms uh, uh, you know, there's the personal level of if you have cardinal planets, um, you know, they got the shit kicked out of them this year. Um, if you've got, <clears throat> um, and that that's moving on and then, you know, some of the difficulties are handed off to fixed, but what is occurring for the fixed signs is not as intense as what happened for the cardinals. Um, but they also just speak to the quality of time um, that the massive overabundance of planets and cardinal signs in 2020, cardinal is beginning, here's a new thing energy, and boy, did we get a lot of new things in 2021. It's like, here's, you know, here's 40 new problems to solve, right? Whereas, um, as you said earlier, Chris, about fixed signs, um, there's a very strong continuing energy. Well, that's not what you said, but I know that 
you think that because it's true. Um, <laughs> um, but it, you know, we've kind of been handed uh, a lot of the situation and it's fixed. The, the, the fixed signs are, they're going to keep this going, right? None of the, none of the problems which were presented, you know, cardinal presentation, um, in 2020 are gone, right? Like we're going to be working on all this, right? It's not like, um, you know, a lot of these things were, were the beginning of arcs not uh not momentary blips um and so i'm i'm trying i've been trying to think about how to uh how to encapsulate or evoke um the fixed saturn and aquarius for the next two years well more than the next two years but especially the next two years as being uh very fixed are we in a a fixed crisis there's it's an ongoing right? Like fixed signs are, it's something that's ongoing. It's not new and it's not about to change. It's ongoing. So I, I don't know. I, I don't, as I said, I've been working on it, but I don't have the the phrase yet. I don't think. Yeah. Well, I think at least we know our, our cardinal friends can breathe a bit of a sigh of relief. I think are, are either of you with heavy cardinal placements? I know Austin, you especially ready for, for a vacation. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Something like I'm that. I'm ready to go oh. into exile, <laughs> not just a vacation. <laughs> okay, well, we might we might need you to navigate the astrology of next year, so don't check out completely. Um, all right, so we're at the end of our first. We're going a little over time for our initial introductory overview, but I think that's pretty good. Are there any things that we forgot to mention? Just as our our sort of brief sketch of the major things that are are happening that we meant to say in 2021 before we jump into the first quarter. I feel like we could jump in and anything else we'll we'll have time to go into. Yeah, I feel okay. like that's more than sufficient as far as a thematic overview. All right. Well, in that case, let's do it and let's jump into the astrology of January of 2021, which sounds really futuristic and bizarre to say. Uh, here we go. So this Where's is my the, flying car. Yeah, exactly. Where's my flying um, motor? My flying uh, skateboard. I'm, I really feel robbed by Back to the Future Part Two. The closest <laughs> well, we got, got was Biff like Biff as president. <laughs> we did. That's true. We got Biff as president. We got like roving for a little bit before the pandemic, like scooter gangs with like e-scooters. Um, that was the closest we got, the, which I guess is a the, okay. I guess the Segway is not a good replacement for the hoverboard. I, I right. do not accept. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see where we are at by the end of the decade. Maybe they just missed like a digit or something like that. Um, here's the planetary alignments calendar um, that Paula Bellomini and I designed for January of 2021. So this is from our poster, which I just finally released on the Astrology Podcast website for this year, and people can order at theastrologypodcast.com/slash 2021 posters. So we can see the main sketch of January features Mars moving into Taurus on the 6th, uh, Mercury into Aquarius on the 8th, and Venus into Capricorn the same day. We've got a new moon in Capricorn on the 13th, Uranus stations direct in Taurus on the 14th, Jupiter square Uranus is the biggest outer planet transit, which is taking place on the 17th, uh, Sun ingress on the 19th of Aquarius, full moon in Leo on the 28th, and Mercury stations retrograde on the 30th of January. So that's a lot of stuff going on right away, right from the start. I'm not sure if it's as big as last year where we had the Saturn uh, Pluto conjunction, like right at the top. And that's right when the first, like the New York Times posted their first report about COVID, uh, I think within a day of that. But, um, I guess our main signature is that Jupiter Uranus square for January. And Mars moving um, into I think, Taurus. Yes, I would say that Mars uh, moving into Taurus and hyper activating the Uranus Saturn um, right away is, is what I'm looking at. All right, let me pull up the chart and let's look at the actual chart for that time yeah. period. Yeah. And that's Actually. something to keep in mind as you, people are conceptualizing the year is Mars through the fixed signs is going to really amplify, stir up the Uranus-Saturn square. And yeah, we get it right out of the gate. Right. That's so funny. So we're all, we've all been like 
dying for Mars to leave Aries finally. It's been in there for six months now. We could all use a break, but then the downside is once it once it moves into Taurus finally in January, all of the other like inner planets and outer planets have moved into Aquarius. So it just sets up this powder keg where Mars starts moving up to conjoin Uranus in Taurus at six degrees and squaring all of the fixed sign placements in Aquarius, uh, which is like Saturn, Jupiter, Mercury, and so on. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, the other so the other ingress I was just going to say that's important in early January is Mercury into Aquarius because that will set up uh, an unusually long stay of Mercury in Aquarius, which will roll into its retrograde, which is just more fixed activation. Do we get three? Because I, I see Mercury yes. squaring Uranus oh, right as soon as it goes sorry. in on January eighth at zero degrees of Taurus to zero degrees of Aquarius. When when Mercury retrogrades in Aquarius, does it hit Mars again, or does it just come close? Sorry, we get three. Uh, yeah, we do get There's two to stations. Mars. Stations retrogrades in late January and comes back, and then yeah, it hits hits Mars. So it looks like the second square is at seventeen Aquarius to seventeen Taurus on February tenth. And then a Merc eventually Mercury stations direct, moves forward again, and much later, once they both move into Pisces and Gemini, we get the third square on March 23rd. So that's opening up a, a nice sequence of events of three Mars-Mercury squares over the course of basically the first quarter of the year. So that's a nice little signature. From memory, there's a fair bit of Mercury Mars action throughout the year, just based on where Mars is when Mercury does its retrograde cycle. Uh, but this one is is riding in the fixed stuff. What are your uh, Mercury Mars square keywords, Kelly? Oh, Mercury square Mars. I always think about discord, disagreement, like that idea of a heated conversation, or even sometimes being attacked with words or facts or data. Uh, sometimes it can prompt a soft-spoken person to speak up more. So the heat of Mars uh, can stimulate Mercury. You know, sometimes people blurt things out, and at times it may feel a little premature or inelegant. But it's often there's a rawness or an honesty to Mercury Mars that um, is can be very clarifying, even if it can be a bit sharp or uncomfortable to swallow in the heat of the moment. Yeah, those are great keywords because sometimes the argumentative or need to speak out against something even forcefully is necessary, but other times it can manifest as more of a, a verbal combativeness and a, and a negative exchange or a fight that that sometimes you might wish that you hadn't have once you cool down. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely like a yeah, it's, you do just want to have a little bit of caution about what you say, how you say it, or who you say it to, usually with a Mercury, when it's a square aspect or, yeah, some, some difficult aspect. Mm. All right. So, uh, Austin, the pile up in Aquarius and the square in tension with the two planets, Mars and Uranus, and their conjunction in Taurus. What is the, what is the vibe you're getting off of that? Yeah. So, that basically, um, you know that sprinkles gunpowder on the longer Saturn Uranus themes, right? Like the you know we, we got a taste of dem uh, demonstration, unrest, revolt uh, energy during the preview period last spring or last Northern Hemisphere spring, um, and you know as we just spent a fair amount of time talking about those themes are going to be a consistent part of the next two years and you know uh and mars's ingress uh into taurus just kicks that off right away right just sprinkles gunpowder all over it um and so you know this is mars with uranus right so uranus and taurus so, um so uranus is always like something to um revolt over right something some some something that's not good enough like this needs to be upgraded this needs to be better right and right, then taurus like the, it's just to interject the the united states birth chart has a mars uranus conjunction by sign at least in gemini doesn't it 
Yeah, absolutely. So just right. to think of like, um, like the revolution, a country born out of like a revolutionary war and and what have you, fitting in with your keywords. Yeah, that's a good that's a good example. Um, and so Uranus and Taurus, right? Um, is Taurus Taurus is a uh, Taurus is about grounded things. Uh, it's about food and shelter and money. Right, um, and so I, I think actually one of the best, one of the best examples <laughs> of Uranus and Taurus has just happened recently, which is the massive uh, farmers movement in India. Right, it's literally revolting farmers is mm -hmm. Uranus and Taurus, right, and it's about food production, um, and so you know in. Um, I haven't, I'm not as familiar with the statistics in other countries, but I know in the United States, for example, we have uh, an eviction and foreclosure crisis looming, right? Um, and there, there's sort of a, a tsunami held behind a very thin and cracked dam. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a lot of damage that was done in 2020. Um, which hasn't fully, uh, which w whose impact has not been fully felt, um, and I think that this Mars Uranus Saturn thing is going to see that start to. I don't know if it's a, it's more than trickle. It may not be a full dam burst, but it's certainly some of that, um, that very Torian simple damage, right? Food, shelter, et cetera, et cetera, starts coming through, and I don't know. There's um, people. People are pretty good. At um, getting pissed when they when they uh, en masse when they don't have food, shelter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there may be some food supply and logistics issues which come through. Um, yeah, but food and shelter, I would say that the trigger points uh, for whatever contention are food and shelter there. And to bring the uh, the Mercury Mars square in, um, you know, what does Mercury have to talk about? What do Mar what do Mercury and Mars have to talk about or fight about? It's on a on a macro level, it's going to be these issues. Right. And then the question will be for Saturn and Jupiter in Aquarius. Okay. Uh, okay. Saturn's, you know, um, uh, the, the okay uh, structure planet. What do we do about this? What is the policy that deals with this huge disruption to these Torian things that we really don't like disrupted? Right. Mm -hmm. We like a little, um, we like a lot, a little volatility, a little surprise in some areas of life. Um, not so much with the food and shelter. That's a really good and interesting point about um, Taurus as being associated with like the material, and it makes me think of uh, in the Bitcoin episode. So much, so yeah. many astrologers have been discussing that in that ingress of Uranus over the past couple of years into Taurus and changes in currency, and mm -hmm. how something like Bitcoin comes along a digital currency, but it's also a digital currency that is very volatile and fluctuates very wildly up and down. Um, and having Mars go in there with Uranus um, in Taurus, one of the things that makes me think of is like currency volatility and um, some of that coming up as being relevant in addition to some of the things you were saying about like food and shelter and other basic material necessities, thinking of Taurus. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point about currency. One, because Uranus and Taurus in the past has coincided with um, big disruptions to currency as stores of value, and you know I, I think what what shows it as a Taurian thing um, is that it's something that likes to be stable, right? Like food supply and like shelter. Um, some things benefit from volatility. Food, shelter, and money do not benefit from volatility. Mm. Right. Yeah, they're they're really the core things that give people a sense of safety or security, and interfering with those uh, will definitely uh, bring about reactions. And I think as we're talking about, you know, the symbolism of of this Mars in Taurus, I think it's also important to put this timing piece together, which is that. Mars is in Taurus making the aspects to Uranus and Saturn in January as Saturn and Uranus are moving towards each other. So there is that real link between January and February where Saturn and Uranus form their degree-based square in February, but Mars comes in kind of stirring things up or activating. I mean, I always use the phrase of like tilling the soil, but it's literally like you know stirring things up as we're getting into that first Saturn-Uranus activation. By degree. Yeah, that's, that's a really good yeah, point. That's, 
and I keep coming as a oh go ahead i keep coming to when the conjunction occurs and one of the things that makes me nervous is just um, the Mars Uranus conjunction at six degrees of Taurus conjoins on January 20th, and the Moon catches up and then moves through over that at the same time. And that's squaring the stellium in Aquarius of like the Sun, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mercury. But January 20th, of course, in the United States is the is inauguration day. So that'll also be Biden's Ooh. inauguration. Um, so that makes me a little nervous because that is, as we're saying, Mars Uranus is kind of a volatile. Uh, aspect to have that conjunction going exact then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, oh, and that one, date. One, go ahead. Sorry, Austin. I was just going to say one thing about sort of the macro situation there um, is that it is helpful that Jupiter is with Saturn um, because that Jupiter really helps Saturn be a little bit more constructive. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if we take sort of a raw archetypal Saturn and we say, uh, oh my God, there are all these problems, fix it. The archetypal Saturn might say, suck it up, right? Whereas um, uh, toughen up, Uh, Jupiter is kindlier, right? It's like, oh, what can I do to help? And it's still a very Saturn-y, Jupiter, um, it's like, well, what can I, what can I do to help with some some policy things and this and that, right? It's not um, all embracing and oceanic in its bounty, um, but Jupiter is there at least trying to help. Yeah. yeah, that's something I've said a few times to students uh, and my membership over the last little while is that if we're going to have this strong Saturn in Aquarius signature or these Saturn Uranus activations, it's nice to have Jupiter involved just as a little bit of a helper or a greasing the wheels or a little bit of support, limited as it may be. It it, it, it is a, a small boon to have uh, Jupiter in the mix rather than to have this going on without Jupiter there. Right. Because otherwise, yeah. Saturn is really good at, at negating or critiquing things and saying, you're not doing a good enough job in this area. This is broken. This isn't working. You need to do better in this area. But Jupiter is much better at growing things through affirming them and like pointing out the good things or the things that you can do. Or this is an area where it would be easier for us to work on this and having growth in that area. Um, so hopefully, it will help be able to balance out and create a nice synergy um, there in terms of the critical portions as well as the more um, affirming portions working in unison. The only problem is that you know, with that square with Uranus and Mars happening, especially in the first quarter, there's some sort of like conflict or, or needling or um, tension that is um, making it a little bit harder for those two, that pair to operate, I feel like, than it, it would be otherwise. Uh, or uh, in addition to that, uh, I would say one of the things that Mars does um, is it speeds up the time frame um, mm-hmm. where it's like it's a hot crisis rather than like a slow ongoing thing. Um, you know, Mars is like, yeah, but this needs to get done this week. And Saturn's mm-hmm. like, well, you know, um, we're going to go to committee for three months and then we're going to debate it and we're eventually going to come to a thing. And Mars is like, I'm, I'm literally getting shot at right now. Um, yeah. changing, you know, you know what I mean? Like it, it's a quick thing. Um, and so Mars speeds things up. Definitely. Um, so a greater sense of urgency and a, and a push to do something in a much shorter time frame. whereas Jupiter and Saturn is the two largest and slowest visible planets otherwise tend to m- move much more gradually. Yeah. And even, even when they're constructive, it's, you know, it, it's a little bit, especially in a Saturn ruled sign, it's a little bit more committee shaped rather than, you know, um, it's the hero we deserve, unfortunately, rather than the hero we need. Right. Um, right. They, they right. don't parachute in through the window with, you know, foodstuffs and, um, you know, cover your rent. Well, let's see. So two more things we have in the notes to cover for January to keep us moving. One of them is the tense full moon in Leo towards the end of the month. And the other thing is I need to mention the election, which is at the beginning of the month. Uh, which one makes sense to do first? Probably, well, I think we can just Yeah. With the full moon, I think we can just say it just highlights all the stuff. 
it's a fixed full moon. It just sort of, um, it gives full moon visibility and activation to these tensions that we've been talking about. Um, like it, it's kind of a little bit more of the same. Yeah. Cause here it is. It's at mm. nine degrees of Leo, uh, opposing the sun at nine degrees of Aquarius. The sun interestingly is closely conjunct Jupiter at nine degrees of Aquarius at that time, which sounds nice and optimistic. The only issue is that Mars has hit about 10 degrees of Taurus and it's still separating from that conjunction at, of with Uranus at six degrees of Taurus. So it creates a pretty tight T square for a lunation and lunations themselves tend to be a culmination of events or bringing to light of something. And having Mars right there at the apex um, just seems tense, like um, conflict or like stress or discord or something that's being heightened at that time, around the time of a full moon when things are already heightened in some sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like outbursts. Outbursts, that's a good keyword. All right, so I think in that case then I will introduce our, because this year ahead forecast doubles as our forecast for January. I need to mention our electional chart for January, and it actually happens really early in the month. Our electional chart that we wanted to highlight, which is the best chart for or the best date for starting new ventures and undertakings using the principles of electional astrology that I found with uh, Lisa Scheim, is set for January 1st, uh, 2021, with early Aquarius rising, so like two degrees. Or so of Aquarius rising. So, let me pull that chart up back to, back up here to January first. Move well, the time. That's a very calendar convenient election. Yeah, January first, right? Well, and it's a little yeah. anno annoying, of course, because anybody listening to this later in January will have missed it. Uh, but for those, since we're releasing this towards the middle of December, hopefully enough people will be able to use it. Part of the issue is just. The best election falls at the beginning of the month because Mars is still in Aries at that point and it hasn't moved into Taurus where it starts squaring all the Aquarius planets. So we did something a little tricky with this election by basically allowing you to try to skip the tension of the Mars squaring everything month by getting your election in early on January 1st to try to take advantage of the Jupiter Saturn conjunction before that square with Mars gets within 3 degrees or gets too terribly close. So set the electional chart for January 1st, 2021, adjust it to about let's say approximately 8:40 a.m. in your location and then adjust the chart until in your location you have 2 degrees of Aquarius rising which will put Jupiter and Saturn right on the degree of the ascendant, especially Jupiter. So this is a Saturn election. It's a day chart with Aquarius rising, and Saturn is um, in the first house, ruling the ascendant, and it is conjunct the benefic Jupiter, who is fully benefic since it's a day chart. Uh, the moon is in Leo, and it's not really applying to major planets except for a very wide trine with Venus, which is at 21 degrees of Sagittarius in the 11th whole sign house. This is kind of a continuation and a reusing of the Saturn election from December, close, closer to the conjunction that we used last month or earlier this month. But it would be good Saturn Jupiter type election for long term things that might start off slow um, and sl be slow to develop. But if they're successful, then they will become successful in the long term and you'll find. Um, some good stability and things with that of a Saturnian and Jupiter theme type nature. Now, it's a little hard to get away from the Uranus square since Uranus is at six degrees of Taurus, but at least it's more than three degrees away. And while that might introduce some element of instability, if you're able to use that in a way that's like unique or innovative, I think you should be able to incorporate it into whatever you're doing in a successful way. So this is our one electional chart that I'm going to highlight for January. Lisa and I found three or four other charts for January that we're going to introduce in the Auspicious Elections podcast, which is available for patrons through our page on patreon.com. And we also just released our year ahead 2021 electional astrology report, where we went through each of the next 12 months and we released one electional chart for each month, finding the most auspicious date we could for 
for each of the next 12 months. So you can find out more information about that on my website, which is chrisbrennanastrologer.com. All right, so that's the election for the month. Um, are you guys starting anything? I know you're recording a podcast tomorrow, Austin. I think I'm going to release this episode. Are you guys going to try to initiate any product uh, projects with the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that's happening over the next few weeks? I'm attempting to initiate some rest. <laughs> initiate a nap? Okay. A le- yeah, electional chart some, for a nap? Yeah, just some kind of slow unwinding. So nothing new launching for me. I like that. Nap time electional astrology is a long and venerable tradition going back to Guido. Yeah, I, I'm Bonatti. trying to like Rip Van Winkle it or something with the satin, maybe. <laughs> okay. Austin, <laughs> are you little. making any talismans or magical potions or anything like that? No, I actually um, uh, considered it and came up with a few elections and then read cards on it. And the uh, the divination gave it a very emphatic no. There'll be plenty of things that have, you know, um, Saturn supported by Jupiter, but the um, uh, got a got a set of resounding no's about making stuff with that conjunction. Right? It's um, it, it it got me thinking about how there are there's some configurations which are worth saving, right, and giving them a little physical body. Um, mm-hmm. And then there are other configurations which you don't want to save, but are very important to observe, like eclipses, right? Um, the uh, <laughs> uh, eclipse talismans do lots of things, most of them harmful um, uh, or just strange. Um, but it's not something you want to. It's not something you want to save, but it's it. They're nonetheless very important to observe. And so, through my thinking and divination around it, it was something worth observing, and I, I mean observing in a quasi-religious sense, right? Like you know, an uh, an observation. So I think I'm going to be doing a little, little ritual thing, which is kind of coming together. Um, but I don't think that we're going to make anything. Okay. Uh, well, there will be other opportunities for uh, Saturn in, in Aquarius and Jupiter in Aquarius elections during the course of the, this year. I know after looking, and I'm actually excited because 2021 honestly was very difficult for electional astrology because everything was just in, you know, Capricorn or retrograde in Aries for pretty much the entire year, and it was really hard to work around the tense portions. But this year, there's definitely some some optimistic sections and some little bubbles where you can get some great electional charts in, like when Jupiter dips into Pisces for a little bit, um, you know, Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions that are a little bit wider later in the year in Aquarius, and so on and so forth. So um, with that out of the way, why don't we move into February so we can we can keep moving here. We're, we're a little bit behind yeah, on time, but I, I pick yeah. it up a little bit. Well, when were we supposed to take our first break? Was it at an hour and 20? In about 15 minutes. Yeah. I think that's in six minutes. We're at an hour and 14 right now. Anyway, let's okay. jump into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do, do it as fast as we can. <laughs> All right. February, uh, Saturn square Uranus, super Aquarius stellium, and Mercury retrograde in Aquarius. Those are our three main things to talk about. Um, where do you want to start? Let's I mean, just talk about Aquarius. Yeah. We're of the same mind, Kelly. You go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's so unusual to see so many uh planets, visible traditional planets in the one place. And February is unique because for most of the month we're going to have five planets, Venus, Saturn, Jupiter, Sun, Mercury all in Aquarius, and then of course around the new moon in Aquarius we will have the moon there as well, which is six out of the seven traditional planets or visible planets all Look in the at same that. place. That's- that is amazing. That is an amazing stellium and lineup. That reminds me, there was like I haven't seen a stellium like that since there was one in like 1962 in Aquarius. I was, yeah, I was just relooking at that because I have a client who was born in that 1961 or 62, and I was like, oh my god, this was the last time we had the super Aquarius because that was like Saturn, Jupiter, and the node was there. Plus, we had you know in the Sun in Aquarius period, and there was Venus or Mercury or maybe both actually. Right. Um, yeah. So if you're curious or confused, if you're confused about what Aquarius might mean for you personally or what it might 
what themes it might bring out collectively. I think just pay attention to what comes up in February is, is a very simple way of approaching it, you know, without getting too granular that there's you you can't miss whatever Aquarius is for you in February because so yeah. many planets are just right. bringing that message home. It's just going to be in your face at that point and and clustering very closely in that sector of your chart, just like the Capricorn stellium was last year in March, which piled up in my like twelfth house, and then I got sick uh, and was stuck in my house for like two months being sick. What was you guys? Did you have similar like pile up in some house type? Events. Yes. Okay. We don't have to go into it. I don't yeah. want to <laughs> private details about different houses. Um, but yeah, so Aquarius, think about what house and what sector of your chart that pileup is going to be in. Obviously, there's other things you can layer on top of that, like, you know, what perfection you're in and other things like that in terms of whether it's going to be super heated for you, but it should be a nice concentration. Um of whatever that energy is going to be this year. And so uh, something to add is that with the sun going through Aquarius with all these planets, um, we're seeing a, the sun in Aquarius conjoin. Lots of planets or other planets conjoin the sun. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And so oddly, even though we have you know a, a sky full of Aquarius, almost all of this is going yes. to be hidden behind the sun's beams, right? So there's just going to be a tremendous amount happening literally behind the scene behind the scene of the sun. Um, and those conjunctions with the sun are regarded, they're, they're cycle resets, right? So we have, you know, uh, Kazemi, 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 Kazemi. We have all these cycle resets where the planets uh, metaphorically travel through the, the, the fiery heart of the sun. Um, and, you know, I think that it's for both you know, at all scales, right? Individual up to macro. It's sort of this, um, the, the sun and all the other planets visiting with Jupiter and Saturn, right? Who are, who've got a new plan to remake history, right? They're like, okay, next 200 years. This is the like, oh, this is, this is really the adjustment to, um, the rest of the year and the planning for the rest of the year. Um, uh, in a lot of senses, right? This is like, okay, what's the new plan? Um, in a, I, I think to a certain degree, some of the like, how are we going to start this off? Um, type of thinking is going to that we usually do in January. Or we try to do in January is going to get delayed by the um, Mars, Uranus, Saturn thing. It's like, oh, we got to take this into account. Um, but then by the time we get to February, we're like, okay, all of the, uh, all the data, good, bad, and other is in like, let's think and plan on this. Um, and so I, I th you know, and it's funny, I, I believe that, um, uh, the, the lunar, the solid lunar that we all commonly called the Chinese new year is going to be, um, uh, is going to be a more accurate, um, beginning of things. Uh, in 2021, rather than the uh, the calendar month of January, beginning the year. Does that, that make sense? That yeah. Well, in that analogy you're using, uh, made me think of how in in Hellenistic astrology, the term they use for when planets get within 15 degrees of each other is an assembly, and it's like all those mm. planets in Aquarius mm. are getting into an assembly to talk and discuss about what what the plan is and what they're going to do. Although it's kind of interesting because Mars is squaring that pretty closely at the same time, um, having come off of the conjunction with Uranus. So it's almost like they're getting together and saying, what are we going to do about this guy uh, who's causing all these problems in Taurus? Yeah. I mean, the Where visual that like, just came, I hate your plan. That right. came to my mind was, you know, I went to a school where we did have a lot of assemblies and, you know, in a, schools in Australia, you wear school uniforms. So there's 600 kids in your uniform, in your grade groups, the principals talking to you about whatever the plan is, or whatever the rules are. And there was always one kid that would just do something crazy. Like they would <laughs> be making noise or, you know, somewhere they weren't, and it would just disrupt the whole thing. I'm like, that's what that Mars in Taurus feels like, the disruptor of the assembling. Like the big, loud fart sound. That's like I was, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. It would be, it would usually, you know, if we're in grade nine or 10, it would be always one of the boys that would be doing fart noises or something. Um, 
But I'm glad you mentioned the visibility on a slightly more serious note right. um, because I had thought about that too and I think it's about the 9th of February that Saturn will start to um, – I didn't check the dates whether that's 8 degrees or 15 degrees from the sun – and about the middle of the month, uh, February 16, that Jupiter steps away. Uh, oh, no, so February 16, that's Jupiter. Yeah, so they, they are there coming out from under the sunbeam. So it does feel like it, we're going to need to get through into February, well into February before the emergence of Jupiter and Saturn from that reset, that, that cycle reset that you mentioned, Austin. Um, okay, I see what you're saying. So you're, you're pointing out how especially in the second half of February, um, you'll start to see all of these planets emerge. And in the they'll, morning. In the morning, they'll start appearing and they'll rise before the sun shortly before daybreak and start emerging into view again. So there's almost something that's hidden, especially in the first half of the month and maybe in late January. Is the late January too, yeah. Traveling through Aquarius and eclipsing all of these planets that that, are, that become hidden and can't be seen, and then all of a sudden in the second half of February, in the mornings, they all start emerging into view and some themes start to show themselves and, and become more clear. Yeah. Yeah. The announcements. Mm. Uh, that reminds me of the term phosis from Greek, which is mm. um, the term for planets that make an appear appearance, is that it's like an appearance that speaks or a, it says something, and it says something as a result of coming out onto the world stage and making itself known. Yeah. Well, that will be fun. There's been so much great um, astronomy, like visual <laughs> astronomy stuff lately. That'll be fun. Okay. That was my- um, That was your was your dry sense of humor. <laughs> talking about this, my dry sense of humor on Twitter yesterday and thanking me for it. Um, fun, yeah. That'll be tense, but it'll be good to have things become known. And sometimes it's the problem that you can't see that's harder to deal with than the problem that you've at least identified and has become clear. And then you can start to wrestle with it versus the thing that's just causing problems, but it's not in your field of vision, so you you can't deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, what else about February? Saturn Uranus first second or no first exact square of Saturn Uranus that's that's huge so the Saturn Uranus is going to be which was already ramping up is going to be like heightened or at its peak so that first square happens the opening square on the 17th of February so to whatever extent we got like a little preview or something of some of the protests and some of the social instability last year when Saturn just barely dipped its toe into Aquarius. Um, we're getting serious, a much more intense version of that, and our first hit of it, our first um, full experience of it should be around mid-February with that first exact square. Yeah, I mean, I, I think January just leads right into that. I don't think it'll pop out of. I don't think we wait till February to see what Saturn Uranus is about. You mm -hmm. know, Mars will be carrying the light. Um, yes, <laughs> between sure. the two, um, it's going to be. I think it's more like, okay, this is what are we going to do about this, right? And it, it uh, so on an internal level, right? If we're thinking about that assembly, it's like, okay, we're going to get our Mercury, we're going to get our thinking, we're going to get our Jupiter, which is our you know hopes, aspirations. How what might how might we grow from this? We're going to get our um, you know our. Uh, how should we say survival oriented Saturn together? We're going to get our, our Venusian passions all together with the sun and think about this situation, right? Like we're assembling um, everything except for Mars. And even Mars is, even though Mars is in, um, you know, a fart noise aspect uh, to these planets, <laughs> um, Mars That's is be uh, the nonetheless. Hashtag. Um, I, I, I want to preface Mar that by saying anybody that has that in their natal chart uh, will come up by the end of the show with a better analogy analogy for you for what that means natally, unless unless it does mean that I don't know. I mean Mars conjunct Uranus, it's pretty it's squaring things. Anyway, I mean there's uh, definitely right, right. noises with Mars square Uranus. There's definitely it, noises. There are there. there are 
you know, bellicose protestations. Um, but anyway, it's, you know, it's everything except for Mars, right? Um, yeah. And so there's the, this assemb- internal assembly as well ex- as external assembly to basically set policy, right? And that's going to look lots of different ways, lots of different places, and with lots of different people. Here is the diagram for that Saturn Uranus conjunction again from Kyle at Archetypal Explorer. And I keep giving him a shout out because it's just such a great, he's not sponsoring this episode, but the past year, I think when the um, COVID pandemic hit and we started dealing with all those outer planet transits and how to present them and starting to use his graphics has been one of the biggest things I've been happy and like grateful for this year using his website, archetypalexplorer.com, just because like plotting something on a graph like this and being able to see it as a part of a continuous movement or wave or something that comes in waves rather than just seeing it as a single discrete like point or date or something like that i think is so valuable in understanding the that it's a process that you're sort of like going through over a period of time which is something we always try to describe on the forecast but it's sometimes hard to hard to visualize so yes. saturn uranus uh anything else about that I feel like we've touched on a lot of the main themes there, so I feel okay about that for and now. Even though we get the sun leaving Aquarius on what, like the 19th, something like that, mm-hmm. towards the end of the month, um, we've still got Venus, Jupiter, Mercury, and Saturn all in Aquarius um, until the 25th and Venus moves, but then we still have Jupiter and Saturn and Mercury. And so that, that overwhelmingly Aquarian theme like really runs uh, into March. Yeah. There is a little bit of an energetic transition as we get into March though, because Mars will move into Gemini um, early in the month and the sun, of course, is then in Pisces. And there's still a lot going on with Aquarius, but we no longer have that Mars square from Taurus pushing onto it. And we do get a little bit more of whether it's that mutable quality of uh, easy come, easy go or fluctuation uh, so that there is a bit of a tone shift uh, once we get Mars into Gemini into March. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And it, we go from like overwhelmingly fixed to, um, you know, fixed and mutable, slightly more mutable, right? Where, and if we talked a lot about cardinal and fixed earlier, you know, mutable is adaptational. It's like, I don't know, let's see what happens, right? Cardinal Mm. is like, I want to do this. Let's this begin one it. Thing. Yeah. Right. Fixed is all right. We're already, you know, we already booked our flight. We're on, we're in the middle of the flight. We're, um, you know, like the train has left the station. Let's manage the process. Whereas mutable is like, ah, you know, let's see how it goes. Let's maybe make some changes, um, get ready for the next thing and also bring whatever this little arc is to a conclusion. Um, and so that's, that's a, it's just a different energy. Like you were saying. Just a different a different quality. Okay, that so sorry. One thing I want to jump back to um, is in adi- even uh, in addition to our Aquarius stellium um, assembly. I really like assembly, Chris. Um, yeah. Being overwhelmingly mm. fixed, our our planet that is protesting Mars is also fixed, right? So it's yes. you know it's still fixed. Um, we're Taurus. not getting away from the fix. Yeah, yeah. There's a huge amount of fixed energy. And also, I don't know if we emphasize this enough, but we're dealing with like a Mercury retrograde all the month of February, and it doesn't station direct until the 20th. So that's complicating or adding a complication to the whole mixture. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, when it's all of that, like how much needs to be rethought? It's such a it's such an appropriate time for uh, such an appropriate time and portion of the sky. Um uh, uh, for Mercury to retrograde through. Mm. And I would also just add as a keyword for fixed, if we're thinking about, so positive would be enduring, right? Negative would be stuck, right? The negative side mm. of being fixed is, is feeling stuck. And stagnant. so there will, there will be that. Yeah. yeah. Stagnant, stuck. Uh, I don't know what to do. I do like after Mercury stations direct, when we were looking at the elections, 
Um, this came up. I like this when Mercury stations direct at 11 degrees of Aquarius around February 20th and starts moving forward again. It starts forming this conjunction with Saturn for several days between the 20th, and it doesn't um, get going fast enough to complete it until it looks like around March 4th. So there's just this very long, very slow moving Mercury. Uh, Jupiter conjunction for a couple of weeks that will happen in the morning sky around that time. And by that point, Mars has moved into late Taurus, so it's not squaring those early Aquarius planets as much. And then eventually it even moves into Gemini um, by March 3rd or March 4th. Um, so I, I kind of like that Mercury Jupiter conjunction. It's something to me to be a little bit more optimistic about or, or Pertaining to like the rectification and affirmation of a situation, which should be somewhat helpful, especially coming out of a Mercury retrograde. Yeah, well, th there's a sense like two things. One, it's Mercury spending a lot of time in the space between our two history planets, Jupiter and Saturn. Mm -hmm. Um, and as far as like a, a experienced uh, in sequence as part of a story, that Mercury spending all that time moving towards Jupiter is like, okay, I think the plan's going to work. Yeah, right. I think yeah. I've got some answers for this. Uh, yeah, we've got we've got agreement about uh, how to move forward, or there is that sense of like a coming together. You know, I always think of a. a a decent Mercury aspect like that is we're on the same page. We can uh, agree to similar things, or we can move forward from here. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's move fully. I think into March. Then I think mm -hmm. we, we basically have. But um, here's the graphic for March. We see that Mars ingress right at the top into Gemini, which is a pretty big shift on the third. Um, lunations, new moon in Pisces on the 13th, full moon in Libra on the 28th. Um, what else is going on in March that's really important and notable that hasn't been mentioned already? The Sun Venus so, conjunction. It, we I don't think it's, con yeah, it, it's, a, it's conjoined in early Aries. Aries. Yeah. And I think it's worth noting that before that, we have the Sun and Venus in Pisces together. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting because um, Pisces is Venus's exaltation, right? It's a place that Venus does very well and can provide, um, you know, all of the seashell jewelry and extravagant dinners that Venus likes to provide. Um, but it's um, Venus is so close to the sun um, that we don't see Venus. We don't. Venus doesn't have much brightness, and so this is, um, you know, it, it, there's still. How should we say there's still enjoyment, um, but it's like quiet, it's private, mm. it's more muted, it's literally hidden beneath the sun's rays. Yeah, so it's not, you know, if people are thinking, oh, Venus is in Pisces, that's fantastic. Just do take into consideration that proximity to the sun. It's not quite as uh, outward or expressive as Venus in Pisces can be when she's a little further from the sun. Sure. Yeah. And then we get that um, conjunction on the 26th when Venus goes into the heart of the sun and uh, starts a new cycle because Venus is moving direct. Um, so the conjunction it has shifted to Aries at that point, as was said earlier. Um, but that's an important reset in terms of setting then a new foundation for the relationship between the sun and Venus that will then evolve over the course of the next several months. And then eventually we have another Venus retrograde coming up like the tail end of the year, right? Yeah, in December. Yeah. Okay. So this will be connected with that in terms of being the opening of the new cycle between the Sun and Venus. So that's at five degrees of Aries. It looks like that conjunction. Yeah. Uh, a, a new setting the stage for a new, I don't know, what is it, 10 month cycle of passion, of yeah. attraction and disgust. And enjoyment and revulsion, right? Like these these relating um, sort of passions. Yeah, interestingly, it looks like Mercury completes its third square with Mars around that time um, at twelve degrees mm -hmm. of Pisces. Mercury's at on March twenty fourth, and it squares Mars at twelve degrees of Gemini. So it finally completes that set of three with Mars at that point. 
Yes. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't love that. No. Speaking of revulsion. Uh, <laughs> speaking of tension. Yeah, and so right the the same Mercury square Saturn or excuse me Mercury square Mars keywords that Kelly brought up earlier. You know, it's it's contentious speech and angry thinking. Um, what is um, a little unlovely about that is that we have uh, Mars right on the head of the dragon, right on the North Node, good old Rahu. Um, mm-hmm. And so, um, uh, especially especially in Vedic astrology, um, you see Rahu, the dragon's head, being associated with confusion, right? It's the, the power to eclipse, which means we can't see clearly. Um, and the combination of uh, of uh, of anger with Mars with confusion um, is a little bit of um, you know a little bit of an infernal synergy, right? It's one thing to be angry; it's one thing to be confused. Angry and confused are unfortunately a potent cocktail. Mm. Yeah, rash choices is the combination, I guess, that comes to mind. Or yeah, yeah, and that, ill-informed that's thing, like Mar- choices or something. Yeah. Like with Mars speeding up the time frame, but with the 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 shadowing power of the North Node, um, but you can't see which choice to you can't you don't you can't see what's the right thing to do, but you have to make a decision in the next ten ten seconds, mm-hmm. right? Yes, yeah, feeling like you've got to yeah, there's a pressure situation, and you you kind of just got to fly by the city of your pants. Yeah, so. Yeah. One of the big signatures then of of March is just that shift to mutable signs, and people should pay attention to in their birth charts the Pisces and Gemini uh, square, um, in, not just in terms of the tension between those two signs, but just in, also in terms of the shift of emphasis a little bit away from that fixed pileup of Aquarius that is much more pronounced in February. Yeah, and one thing that occurs to me as we're looking at this, um, because we just came off the Mercury Jupiter time, right at the beginning of the month, um, is it when we're talking about a shift into a mutable mode, we're talking about adaptation. Um, And although ideally we pivot or change our strategy um, in order to improve it so that it's more coherent with whatever the situation is, sometimes we can make a rash choice and um, disrupt or break an arc that was actually going in a good direction. And that Mercury-Mars square with Mars on Rahu seems like an opportunity to um, sort of um, to steer off a good path. Um, it seems like, you know, uh, like a deer runs out in the road and instead of, you know, keeping on a given path, you know, you end up somewhere else. Right. And it's an interesting contrast then where we, the month opens with a much, um, more peaceful, let's say Mercury Jupiter conjunction around March 4th. But then by the time we get to the end of the month, we, we sort of end March with that Mercury Mars square. Yeah, like um, it's like an opportunity to fuck up a good thing. Mm, that's a, a good good analogy. Ne- negative adaptation. <laughs> right. And then by the very, very end of March, um, Mercury even conjoins Neptune at 21 degrees of Pisces and pretty much ends the month with that. Yeah, it's like, remember how you were thinking when Mercury was conjoined Jupiter and go back to that rather than trusting um the, the intel that mercury and pisces square mars and conjunct neptune gives you yeah the combativeness or um strife of the mercury mars square and then the lack of clarity and uncertainty and sort of nebulousness of mercury conjunct, conjunct neptune yeah all right um i think that's the end of march and that brings us to a running a little over time but i think we should take our first break all right, so we're back from our break, and uh, I wanted to mention our sponsor today, which is the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, which we first started using last year and debuted, I think, on one of our later forecasts. But um, they keep expanding and improving their product, where it's basically a personalized almanac that's keyed into your birth chart, and you actually enter in your birth data 
and then they create a whole personalized report that you can get either in print or digital form. And version 2.1 of their almanac is now available. And instead of just being like this publication that you buy and it applies to everybody and just tells you the astrology of the entire year in general, this actually tells you your personal astrological transits for the entire year. So it's super useful. Um, I've still got my printed spiral bound book form one, um, but I know a lot of people like the digital version. And they also released a wall calendar version of the same personalized sort of approach, but then um, integrated into an actual wall calendar that you can put on your wall and it lists the ephemeris and uh, transits. And it can also be used to do like zodiac releasing periods, planetary condition, annual perfections, solar return charts, and other things using their Hellenistic plugin. So it's based on the Swiss ephemeris, which uses data from literally from NASA, and um, it's pretty affordably priced, uh, starting at ten dollars for the six-month digital almanac, twenty-five for the twelve-month printed wall calendar, and thirty-five for the twelve-month printed almanac. So you can find out more information about them at honeycomb.co. Uh, so thanks a lot to them for being our sponsor. So um, that completes quarter one. We're doing pretty good, like usual. We're being very verbose and we went over time, but we're getting into some good stuff. Let's dive right into quarter two um, and get into the astrology of April. Sound good to you guys? Perfect. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Let me find and put up for those watching the video version the calendar for the month of April from our planetary alignments calendar this year, which you can get a wall calendar poster version of. Here is the alignments for the astrology of April, um, Mercury into Aries on the 3rd, New Moon and Aries on the 11th, Venus into Taurus on the 14th, Sun-Mercury conjunction on the 18th, uh, Mercury and the Sun simultaneously into Taurus on the 19th, Mars into Cancer on the 23rd, Full moon in Scorpio on the 26th, and Pluto stationing retrograding Capricorn on the 27th. The one lone, like hold off planet that is still now all by its lonesome back in Capricorn. Um, so Pluto, Pluto is still, still doing things there. I was talking to Lisa last night and she was reminding me of how Pluto is still all over some of the things in the United States birth chart, which is having its Pluto return. During this time period, and still very much active and relevant, despite the rest of the planets having left that sign. Yeah, yep. Pluto transits will continue even if they're happening without any accompaniments. <laughs> the, the the Pluto transits will continue. Austin, I think you know that phrase. What's the phrase? There's like a phrase like that, like the oh, the beatings will continue <laughs> until morale improves. Oh, yes, exactly. Lord. That's what that reminds me of. The Pluto transits will continue until morale has. Has improved. Yeah. Um, well, let's move into April. What are the highlights? What are the main things we need to touch on in April? Well, I would say first, first off, the um, the beginning and end are very different. We get um, you know the the first half ish of April, um, Sun and Venus in Tor or Sun and Venus in Aries. Mercury gets into Aries by I think the third. And so we've got a little, you know, a little bit of that cardinal energy, a little bit of that like let's begin again, Sun and Aries energy, a little little boost to the spirit. Um Venus is not terribly happy being burnt by the sun and in a sign that's not, you know, um high on the list. So it's um, you know, there, there's maybe some there's some difficulty in like knowing how to feel about things and maybe not or or, <laughs> uh, or how should we say having not being able to harmonize with things on an emotional level. Um, but it's not really big stuff. Um, it's just planets in Aries and then starting in the middle of the month, but especially once we get to what the 20th, 21st, we start getting planets piling into Taurus, um, where they will, where, you know, fixed sign again, where they will be conjoining Uranus and squaring Saturn and reactivating, um, reactivating our, you know, uh, not just yearly, but next two years pattern, right? Our Uranus Saturn square. But this time from the Uranus side rather than the Saturn side. 
Yeah, that's really my standout feature for April is just how we do get that shift later in the month and we start to see more of that fixed focus, which is going to pop up periodically throughout the next couple of years, but that's one of those times, late April and into May, uh, where we do have, uh, as you said, Austin planets on the Uranus side rather than the Saturn side, but because they're quicker moving planets, they're just feeding into the longer themes that are already being activated by Saturn and Uranus. Feeding is a really good way to put it. Yeah. So, so first half cardinal emphasis, but second half of the month, definite shift towards fixed emphasis. And people can personalize that, especially in their own charts, by paying attention to where Taurus is in their birth chart. And you'll get a little mini stellium there in the second half of April with the Sun, Mercury, Venus, and Uranus all piling up in that sign. Yes. And so, so go, ahead. go ahead. Okay. So uh just what you know, what does this Uranus Saturn thing look like when we feed the Taurus side versus when we feed the Aquarius side, right? The Uranus versus the Saturn. Mm-hmm. Right. So the Saturn side is <sighs> security, order, planning, et cetera, et cetera. And then the Uranus side is um, you know, is the the freedom innovation, et cetera. Right. So, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense that this is going to be, you know, end of April, we're well into the Northern Hemisphere's spring. Um, all these, pl- these planets piling into Taurus and then conjoining Uranus. That's a lot of like, we're going to go outside like we've never gone outside before. Right. Especially it's Venus. Right. So it's going out and doing the fun things, experiencing the, it's Taurus. Right. So the, the, the physical world. Right, enough digital pleasures uh, already. Let me, let me go literally smell the flowers. Right, the the reimmersion in the material and the material mm. world. It's nice. Mm. It's very hands on, like hands in the dirt in the garden. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that Uranus, though, that there's something revolutionary or innovative about that, like the um, reimmersion in the material well, that- is something that's innovative or rebellious. Yes, yeah, it that's Aquarius. um that's that's a pretty um <laughs> revolutionary act, right? That was the uh the funny thing um that I said a couple years ago. A couple of years um, ago we were talking about Uranus and Taurus. I was like, Oh yes, yeah. in a digital age, meeting up in person is a revolutionary act. Yes. Um, which um, you know, ended up being m- much more interesting a statement than I that I meant it to be. Um, and so I think we can carry that forward. Yeah. Right. Like they're going to the park, getting together with friends for, I don't know, ice cream. Yeah. That ended up being much more prescient. And, and I'm sure an ongoing concern, as we talked about in our pre show chat, which is just, um, you know, what does returning back to normal life um, look like? And what are the timeframes on that? And what are the different ebbs and flows in terms of the success or failure of that as, um, Presumably, the vaccines are rolled out worldwide, and and the threat of the pandemic starts to subside. Um, what does the new normal and the new return back to the physical world of physical interaction look like uh, over the course of twenty twenty one? When I think that, um, you know, as our like long cycles show us that we're we're whatever normal is doesn't look like twenty nineteen. Yeah. Right. Normal will have to reintegrate whatever the new normal is. We'll have to reintegrate the physical world. Um, but I, th- I think it'll take us, you know, I don't know, all of Saturn and Aquarius to figure out what what normal might be. Mm. Mm. But being and, re- you know, reacquainted it, oh, with ahead. it, there's still something there's something new and interesting about it. Like sort of one of the like even the analogy of of those using like a physical book versus let's say like a digital book or an ebook and that being something at some point where there's a flip and that becomes unique in and of itself like preferring the the physical over the digital as a sort of act of rebellion mhm mhm yeah there's um yeah it's not quite antiquarian and it's not quite luddite necessarily but um yeah, there's something about re-encountering an old form and realizing that an old form actually 
has the perfect answer for new problems, which I think is very Uranus and Taurus. Be like, right. oh, this 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 printed book is an amazing data storage device. Um, it doesn't depend on a, a volatile internet connection. It's yeah. so organized. It's right? reliable. It's and available it, all the time. It's uh, it's not giving me cancer by holding right up to my face. Mm-hmm. Right, and you right, can even have a whole. You could theoretically even have like a, a physical location that could have many of these physical books, which perhaps you could purchase Amazing. or check out, or just borrow, or borrow. Right. And it's it, this the the piece that keeps coming up for me as you guys are um, moving through this Taurus piece is that there's some there's sort of a maybe a new or emerging respect for the nourishment that comes from that tangible hands on piece that you can order food on the internet and have it show up the next day, but you could also put some tomatoes in a pot on your in a sunny room in your house or on a balcony if you happen to have one. And there might be something of value to that, even though it's not as fast, perhaps. Yeah. 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 And but just to to go back to Chris, what you're saying about was it the like and re-immersion in the physical, because we've got Uranus, there's some like a shocking return to the concrete, right? Where you're you're surprised at how the book works. Um, and some of this, you know, this is the this is pinging the Uranus Saturn, right? So they, they're mm. um, th- there will be some disruption around this, and this there will probably um, um, another uh, how should we say another serving of um, of social unrest or you know. Um, I was going to say revolting activity. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't mean uh, activity disgusting. Activity that but is I mean, a revolt, right? It's or a, a contestation. You, yeah, it's so funny you use that term because I was thinking about the original meaning of the term revolution, which we think is an act of rebellion and breaking away. But um, you know, revolution is also um, a cycle. It, it also means like the returning back to something and the starting of a cycle over again. And so, like in some of the medieval translations on solar return charts, they're sometimes translated as solar revolutions because it's the sun coming back mm-hmm. to uh, where it started when you were born. And so, the notion of returning back to something that's old and revisiting it again in a new way. Yeah, totally. And so, yeah. um, worth noting that the full moon in Scorpio at the end of the month, I think that's, is it the 26th? Yeah, that was out one of our featured things for April. That's probably worth a mention before. Before you yeah, move it, on it, from the I would say Taurus it, theme, oh, let me just well, drop the, I was going to say this, this emphasizes all the Taurus themes. Okay. Here, let me put that up then. So here's the chart for the full moon at seven degrees of Scorpio on the 26th of April. Mm. And we see for those- Listening to the audio version, the moon at seven degrees of Scorpio, the sun at seven degrees of Taurus. Um, there's still a stellium in Taurus with Uranus at 10, Venus at 15, and Mercury at 16. So, pretty packed stellium, and all of them are squaring Saturn, which is down there at 12 degrees of Aquarius. So one of you the know, things I was going to mention just about the before um, we talked uh, like in the future abstractly back in like May of 2018 and May of 2019 when Uranus first started dipping into Taurus about you know wouldn't that be funny if it was like very literal and it was something like new innovations in food technology or something like that or in meat but I actually saw in the Guardian like a news story about this recently where it said um, no kill in Singapore, lab yeah. Yeah, no kill lab grown meat to go on sale for first time. And it says the subtitle says Singapore's approval of chicken cells grown in bioreactors is seen as a landmark moment across the industry. Uh, so I thought that was really funny and something we'll continue to see, obviously, as Uranus moves through Taurus for several years. But as we start to get some, some of these pileups and signs like Taurus here in April might be relevant in a more localized fashion in some way as well. Yeah, definitely. I I have to say if I had um a no-kill chicken meat company, I do not think I would refer to the the whatever the incubators as bioreactors. <laughs> bio-reactors. That is extremely that is extremely off-putting. 
you would come up with a better like euphemism. What would be a better euphemism for bioreactor? <laughs> they can I'm not uh, sure. their marketing department can email me and I'll help them with it for a few. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go but with I mean no like when do we use the yeah. term the the yeah. only time we use reactor is generally around nuclear reactors. Okay. Um makes me think of um like a meltdown in the bioreactor where it just starts producing, you know, um glorious monstrosities. Uh Becky in the chat says chickenator. I like that. That's actually pretty that's 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 catchy. Yeah, that's fun. Right. All right. So back to back to the astrology here. Full moon in Scorpio, April twenty sixth at the end of the month. Kind of a tense full moon, honestly. Just to me, due to the square with Saturn, and the also proximity with Uranus. So it's almost highlighting that Saturn Uranus square a little bit in a way, even though they've moved apart and they're two degrees separate. Um, but again, just by emphasizing that fixed axis, where one of the things. We're going to start talking about even more as the year progresses is that it seems like the tension points this year are in the fixed signs more than anywhere compared to last year, where the real tension points were in the cardinal signs. Um, and this full moon kind of highlights that again in a way. Yeah. Yes. It's the, it moves the big story forward again. Yeah. It's another one of the check in points. Right. We're feeding right. the bioreactor of Saturn Uranus. <laughs> the the chickenator, yeah. Yes. Um, all right. So I think that's it. So Mars moves into Cancer also on the 23rd, and that's an important shift of Mars out of Gemini and out of the mutable axis into the cardinal mm -hmm. axis. Um is there anything else do you guys want to mention about that? I mean, the big news for me in this quarter is the stuff happening in May and June. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, right. I will just add as one note that will mean something that's not clear to me right now. That full moon in Scorpio is in a mutual reception with Mars in Cancer. Yeah. And I don't think we need to belabor that, but that's interesting and it's going to do something. Make a note. This is in my notes about Mars and Cancer that we discussed in our planning meeting. One of our famous um, phrases from last year, of course. Was in March we said something about like no hugs, uh, the no hug aspect that was happening in March in our year ahead forecast, and then that of course famously became the lockdowns where everybody was like separated and no hugs took on a very literal manifestation. One of our keywords that we threw out, I think Austin threw out or came out of that was uh, aggressive hugs with Mars in Cancer uh, in this part of the year. Yes, although it is tied to the Jupiter ingress a little bit, I think. In uh, terms into of Aquarius? no, the Jupiter into Pisces in May, just in oh, okay. terms of how that creates, you know, a different um cycle setup and then how the Mars in Cancer feeds into the touching that could be going on then with the wetness. Yeah, and one thing we hugging. can say about the transition the family of show. Mars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from Mars and Gemini to Mars and Cancer, Mars and Gemini is very frenetic um, and fast, fast, fast. Whereas Mars and Cancer um, is much slower and more subtle. Um, you know, there some of the conflicts which emerge under Mars in Cancer are potentially very painful emotionally, but it's not like a big, bright surface thing. It's not, you know, all over the interwebs as um, Mars and Gemini will be. You know, we're going from Mars in a Mercury ruled sign to Mars in a Moon ruled sign. Much Good. more intimate conflicts or irritations. Good points. Uh, so here's the calendar for May, where we can see uh, Mercury and Venus moving into Gemini, Newman and Taurus on the 11th. Big uh, move of Jupiter ingressing into Pisces on the 13th of May. So it really just zipped through Aquarius pretty quickly, but it will come back later in the year. And Saturn stationing retrograde in Aquarius, and then a eclipse on the a lunar eclipse on the 26th of May in Sagittarius, and Mercury stationing retrograde on the 29th of May at the very end of the month. 
Yeah, I mean, the big news for me this month is the Jupiter into Pisces ingress. I think it's one of the more, I'm def, I mean, totally biased. The, why, yeah. But- <laughs> why, why would you, the big news for the Pisces stellium is the Jupiter, is the ingress, Jupiter into Pisces. ingress. Yeah. I mean, personally, I'm biased, but I know that you will all share in the goodness and the, the, um, the slightly more hopeful qualities that Jupiter and Pisces will bring. This, to me, is definitely one of the bright spots of the year. I think we've got Jupiter and Pisces from mid-May. Is it late to li- late July, I think? Yeah, it's late July. Yeah. And it's just a preview, but it is a sense of we have a benefic in one of its home sign. There is this sort of uh, taste of of cosmic goodness or that sort of soothing water for the soul or the emotion and just creates a little bit of a a protection or possibly an uplift. <clears throat> but the the reason we, we, I was talking about touching and hugging was, you know, Jupiter and Pisces has more of, it's the opposite of Mars and Saturn in Aquarius, which was the anti-hugging thing from 2020. It's, yeah. you know, if you meet me in person and you're like a friend of mine and I'm so happy to see you, I'm going to give you this big hug because that's, that's how Pisces rolls. I don't even have Jupiter in Pisces, but I know that there is that like that close connection quality. So we're going to be looking for a lot more of that. And in the Northern Hemisphere, at least, we'll have the seasons on our side in terms of health because it'll be, you know, late spring and coming into summer. And remember the last time we had Jupiter in one of its domiciles, which feels so long ago now was uh, a little bit over a year ago, and that was like what 2019 was basically was Jupiter going through Sagittarius, and you guys came out here and we met up in person. Um, mm-hmm. But then that shift happened in December of uh, 2019. Jupiter went into Capricorn, and that is when the the time of troubles began. The time the of times. troubles, <laughs> troubled times. Yeah. yeah. And so one thing I would add um, with Jupiter in Pisces, Jupiter in a sign that it rules, that it's strong in, and uh, similar of similar importance, Jupiter's no longer having to um, be yes. flatmates with Saturn. Like Jupiter and Saturn have been roomies for a long time at this point. So every time Jupiter's like, hey, what if we did this? Saturn's like, yeah, that's not prudent. Right. Mm-hmm. This is Jupiter getting. This is Jupiter gets to move out, at least for a while. Um, you know, have have its own place, and so you know, Jupiter Jupiter operating on its own terms. Um, you know, it, it allows us to see what's possible and see what possible goods there are without immediately thinking of the negative. Which is mm. what happens when Saturn's right there, right? Saturn's like, yeah, well, what about this? And it's like, you know, that there can be a balance there sometimes, but sometimes it's useful to, you know, um, to <laughs> to not have that um, have the immediate Saturnian commentary, right? So if we're talking about uh, on a collective and individual level, looking at workable solutions and. Uh, for the time of troubles, um, looking at solving personal or collective problems, like, and also looking at how the landscape has changed and maybe seeing opportunity um, where there was um, a opportunity or something good, uh, some benefit as a result of a changed landscape, rather than just seeing what was washed away. Mm-hmm. Right, seeing like, oh, well, maybe the yeah, oh, there's a flood and it washed this away, but ah, now the way now now there's a clearer path to X or Y rather than just seeing what was lost. All right, so aggressive aggressive hugs is the summary of all of that that I'm going to go with for keyword for this month is is aggressive hugs. Uh, what are some of the other notes that we wrote down were things like, um. You know, return of travel and the mm-hmm. question about whether this would be more of an explosion of travel with Jupiter returning back into its sign, uh, bookending that period in late 2019 when Jupiter was in its sign and then moved into the sign of its depression or its uh, fall opposite to its exaltation in Capricorn. I know, Kelly, that was something you were interested in, something you talked about a lot earlier this year. With Jupiter being in the sign of its depression in 2020, just mm. the you know sort of massacre of the travel in- industry when Jupiter, the planet of travel or most associated with travel, was in 
the sign traditionally that was said to be for 2,000 years um, the one where it had the most problems. So that's one theme. Yeah, and I think to bring in some of the points Austin was making, I defined Jupiter as having three strikes against it in 2020. It's in fall or depression, it's co-present with Saturn, and it's in a sign ruled by Saturn because it can be co-present with Saturn without also being in a sign ruled by Saturn. And Mm. so there's this real compounding factor. And all of those things, co-present with Saturn, ruled by Saturn, and in depression, they're all Saturn factors restricting, impeding, inhibiting, blocking Jupiter. And so in 2021, Jupiter in Aquarius is not in fall, but still ruled by Saturn and co-present. So that's like two strikes and one tick. It's an improvement, but still a level of caution. But then we come to this mid-year period, which I've described elsewhere as like a bit of an oasis in the middle of the desert, where it's this the, the wetness or the connection, whether it's a feeling or a solution. It's, you know, Jupiter is not in a sign ruled by Saturn. It's gone from being depressed in fall to uh, the power of rulership. And so we, we really get this this sense of of something coming forward with a level of flow, um, maybe a mobility, but now we have the the mutable kind of flexibility, adaptability with a purpose or with a way forward. It's like this is the way through. And I like what you were saying, Austin, about you know, it hasn't just been a flood, but something has been revealed. And it does take me back to the beach where sometimes after a big wave has has come through or a high tide and then it it disperses and you might see these beautiful shells or now you can get out to this place that wasn't accessible before. So there is this uh, very changing dynamic, I guess, that has a quality that is perhaps uh, positive or hopeful to look forward to. Yeah. Absolutely. One of the one of the things that makes me nervous, though, is that it's only temporary, and it's like a temporary um, taste of Jupiter, a temporary return to Jupiter being in good shape again and being free from Saturn. But Jupiter only stays in Pisces this mm. year for couple like you know a couple months, and then it goes back into Aquarius, where it's not only where Saturn is not only as you were saying its roommate, but also it's like. Um, it's landlord at the same time. So it's like you're rooming with your landlord and they're kind of stern and you're not throwing any parties uh, while you're staying there. Yeah. So it is yeah, a, it is a short-term taste of something that will return for a longer or more enduring way in, into 2022. And so when we talk about things like travel and things like that, I, I am a little unsure as to how much we get open or whether it's like this is the plan for what will happen with travel returning more with a view for that to come into 2022. Especially because well, like the Mercury. It, it's not, I, I would say, we need to remember that the, the whole world doesn't do one policy, right? This will be the return of travel some places. There are probably other places that won't do that or will have more restrictions, Right. Like th- this is going to be more considerably more open. Right. Um, not absolutely open, but there's certainly going to be more open. And with travel, um, one of the th- one of the things that we were talking about um, is the the fact that Mercury is in Gemini. Um, during the same during yes. this period of time, and Mercury also likes to travel. Mercury yes. loves to go here and there and bop around, and so between those two, it does not look like people staying in their houses. It looks like people going everywhere. Um, someone in the comments said, "So this is so it's spring break." Um, I think that's a great um, sort of concentration of a lot of this stuff. Like second half of May, absolutely, lo- like the planets look like spring break. One of the things that makes me nervous, though, because I, I definitely agree with all that, with Jupiter being in Pisces and then Mercury and Gemini also liking to travel and emphasizing those themes in May, uh, but then Mercury stations retrograde. It stations at 24 Gemini around May 29th, May, May 30th, and that degree range of Gemini is really close to and similar to where Venus stationed retrograde um, in 2020 in the late spring or early summer. And it was squaring Neptune similarly, uh, where Mercury stations at 24 Gemini and it's square Neptune at 23 
uh, Pisces, and it just makes me think of there being something illusory about that, and then Mercury having to station and then turn around and move backwards. And similarly, Jupiter eventually stationing retrograde and moving backwards makes me wonder if there isn't something that at first it's um, a mistake almost thinking that everything just goes back to normal and everything's great, and then there's some sort of U-turn that has to take place or a revision of that in some ways. Um, and then you go back into, so Mercury then retreads its steps in Gemini, and Jupiter retrogrades back into Aquarius, and there's this revisiting and retooling and replanning effort until Jupiter fully emerges back later on into Pisces late, late in the year, and Mercury eventually stations direct in Gemini three weeks later at some point in June. Um, those are some of the things I was thinking about that, that station around that time and balancing both the optimism of, of those placements as well as um, this sort of retooling or retrograde phase that also happens at the same time. Yeah, one thing I would add with the uh, um, the Mercury retrograde, right? Because uh, so we, um, because we have Mercury retrogrades in air signs this year. It means whenever Mercury enters an air sign, it's going to be there forever, like almost Long two time. months. Um, and so I think part, um, I think one scenario where the Mercury retrograde um, m makes a lot of sense, it, but it's Mercury retrograde in a sign where it's really strong, um, is that. Um, there's going to be an overwhelm uh, on travel stuff because everything's been you know shut down or toned down. And so what happens when there's a crazy spring break surge like through all of the transportation systems, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, which reminds me, there was something about a transportation strike that I saw in the news the other day, but this is six months from now or five months from now. But um, that's another thing, right? Is like when you go from zero to 60, um, you know, you're likely to get some, some snafus. Um, and I think that might be part of it because it's, uh, it's, it's not only retrograde, it's strong. Yeah. Right. Well, and that was part of what we saw in the retrograde of, at least in the U S of, um, the Venus retrograde in like May and June was the return attempt to return back to normal and the lessening of the restrictions. But then the second wave happened and um, some of the restrictions ended up having to come back or be reimposed as a result of that. Um, so we should mention the lunar eclipse since we're moving back into eclipse season once we get to this part of the year, which takes place on the 26th of the mm. month in Sagittarius. Yes. Because uh, especially since it's a lunar eclipse in Sagittarius, that again probably emphasizes potentially some of these themes of travel. Uh, whether literally or metaphorically. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And Austin, when you were talking about like the, or both of you about the potential messiness with the Mercury and and the movement and going from zero to a hundred, it also makes me think about staffing. You know, a lot of airline mm. and even transport and logistics companies they've laid off staff, or uh, airline companies have laid off a lot of staff, whereas transport and logistics companies might have hired staff because you know more stuff is being shipped rather than people going to stores. So I just wonder about staffing for things like that. And you know, if you lay off all your staff and then you have to pull them back quickly, you know. Is there a rustiness or do you have to hire people that haven't worked in the industry? So I, I do think there's a lot of messiness and that lunar I, eclipse. I think that's an awesome point. Thank you. Yeah. And the, the lunar eclipse in Sag, uh, I think it's important to mention it's it's going to be a f maybe, is it a total lunar eclipse? It's cl close-ish to the nodes. I'm not sure. It's just, Pretty it's going to pick up some of the themes of the solar eclipse from December 2020, just that we're now back into Sag for an eclipse. Yeah, I think it is total. Um, I have it listed on mine as a total okay. lunar eclipse. Mm. So yeah, that's makes sense. a pretty heavy eclipse. So one interesting thing to note is that, um, so that's a lunar eclipse in Sagittarius, which is ruled by Jupiter. And so the uh, ruler of the the sign that the the moon is eclipsed in is that super strong Jupiter in Pisces. Mm, and what's good interesting point. is the sun has also got its ruler in domicile, right? Sun's in Gemini, um, and Mercury's in Gemini. Um, I'm not sure how to parse that 
at this moment, but that seems significant. Yeah, so it's a, it's a huge emphasis on mutable things at the very end of May going into early June. So there's the Definitely. just talk through some significations of that really quickly. Like Gemini is communicative, talkative, there's a lightness to it and a socialness to it. Um, there's a lunar eclipse, which is like a sort of culmination, and um, the moon is at peak brightness at that point. So it's really shining a light in Sagittarian type themes. And as you were saying, Jupiter type themes, especially while Jupiter, Jupiter itself has emerged out from its long, arduous journey through the two Saturn ruled signs and just barely suddenly started to emerge back into its own domicile or back into its own throne in Pisces. Um, so it's like a reassertion of the Jupiterian themes, perhaps of things like optimism, of travel, of um, growth. Expansion. What are some other Jupiter themes that become prominent on a, a lunar eclipse in Sagittarius, with Jupiter having returned back to its home sign? Well, I, I think those are that's a good list of themes. <clears throat> and so, like you said, it's the Moon as bright as possible in this Jupiter place, but then its entire face is shadowed. Right. So there's it, yeah. it speaks to something. Um, something obscuring what would normally be a point of brightness. Right. Maybe that's also reiterating at the same time or along par parallel lines the thing that happens immediately after this, which is Mercury stationing retrograde square Neptune. Maybe there's something that's not clear um, that sort of throws a wrench in things shortly after this point. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that's what takes there, us into June. Yeah, there's something. There's something there. There's something not just fully happy Jupiterian, right? Mm. A piece of that is 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 stained as it's the moon's overlooked. face is stained. Yeah, I mean, because Mercury square Neptune is sometimes like dishonesty or or lies or misinformation or misunderstandings or um, miscommunications and overwhelm, like not being able to juggle details because. You know, for a variety of reasons, and I think that ties into the idea that it's not just a regular full moon in Sag; it is an eclipse where there is that sense of what are we not seeing or what did we miss? And I can't help but keep thinking about airlines and travel industry, you know, rushing to ramp up again and and a few things getting missed along the way. You know what I just realized? Remember, because this is a Sag eclipse, so this is the follow up to what was started or what happened at the previous Sag eclipse in December. Yes, and we there's two things that happened that were major things in the news that day. One of them, um, of course, was was the electoral college in the U.S. voted, and Biden won the electoral was awarded the electoral votes, and therefore, like officially, was almost um, you know won the presidency. And that Sagittarius eclipse was in his rising sign. The other major thing that happened, of course, literally the same day. I have a screenshot I wanted to share. Actually, was. The first patient was given the vaccine, supposedly in the United States, on the same day in Sagittarius. So, those are just two news stories of two major events that happened on the Sagittarius solar eclipse on December 14th of 2020. But we should mention that there were probably other things that happened that that lunar eclipse, that solar eclipse series started um, that will. Come to culmination or completion or be connected to on the other end of this lunar eclipse here at the end of May. I, I would see this as the next installment in in the series, which is going to have some thematic continuity. But I wouldn't. I, I I don't see it as the solar handing over to the lunar, where it's the same stuff. There's there's going to be some overlap, but I, I think this eclipse gets to do its own thing as well. Um, I, I really get the sense that. There, there's a p. There's something here that we, in addition to continuing some of the timelines uh, from the present, there's also like mm, something that happens that we, I, I think we can't see very clearly from here. Um, I, sure. I don't think it's just a repetition of what we can see by the end of uh, 2020. But there's at least some sort of connection, possibly between, let's say, something that happened in December. And then something that will happen in May. Yeah. Well, in in last uh, last year of twenty twenty, um, we had like a 
a kind one of those like borderline kind of eclipses um yeah, that was June. lunar and in Sagittarius last June. Right. Um so you know if somebody wants to sit down and think about connecting all of those dots. I mean that was that one was in the middle of the the protests that were happening at the time and I always mm -hmm. associate that eclipse in retrospect with the the protests um because that eclipse fell on Breonna Taylor's birthday and that was a really striking oh like, right moving part right. of that exact one. Um mm -hmm. here's the screenshot that I took of the Washington Post on the morning of December 14th and I was just like we knew the eclipse was coming up we'd been talking about it forever even in our pre-election one, we were talking about like this being the final point where the election is sort of settled. And there was just this one story of like Electoral College convenes to cast ballots for Biden as president. And then on the other side, it said first vaccine given in the US. And I just thought that was such a striking um, couple of news stories to happen on the day of that major solar eclipse in Sagittarius. Falling in again the in the Sibley chart at least one of the proposed charts for the United States in the rising sign potentially of of the United States if the Sibley chart is correct which um, you know 2020 has really brought me around I think I've said you know before on the for forecast the past few months you've you've talked to me around on that and I know Austin you're a pretty big proponent of the U.S. Sibley chart I think it's really useful so you're you're a Sibley truther now. I'm becoming a Sibley truther. Like I feel like a like a 9/11 truther for the Sibley chart, um, and I've never been a diehard like any U.S. chart. And if you listen to that episode that Nina and I did, we were very skeptical about it. But after we after I thought about it more after that episode, it kind of falls in the range of it would happen that afternoon towards the end of the day when the Declaration of Independence was sort of put together and signed. So it kind of makes sense practically, and I just keep coming back to it this year. The fact that we just elected a president who also has Sagittarius rising and Jupiter in Cancer, just like the U.S. Sibley chart does, is a little compelling at the same time. Yeah, well, and uh, uh, we should probably move on, but I will just say, um, a, a nation is not the same thing as an individual. An individual has one clear moment of emerging into the world. I think it's uh, entirely feasible that there are other charts that work for the United States, but it's one of the Sibley's the Sibley is one chart that works very well. Definitely. Not uh, actually a truther. It's just it's it's quite useful. Doesn't mean other things aren't. Right. I don't know what the fire can't melt steel beams of the um Sibley chart truther version is, but let me know if anybody thinks of that. So shall we move into June? We yes. should. All right. Here is the planetary alignments for June. The major things, we can see that Gemini solar eclipse on the 10th of June, Mars going into Leo on the 11th, the second of three Saturn-Uranus squares going exact on the 14th of June, Jupiter stationing retrograde in Pisces on the 20th on the summer solstice when the Sun moves into Cancer, Mercury stationing direct in Gemini on the 22nd, a full moon in Capricorn on the 24th, Neptune stationing retrograde in Pisces on the 25th, and Venus going into Leo on the 26th. Yep. I like doing that because it makes me feel like a, a weatherman, which was an aspiration at one point. <laughs> this is like the astrological version of being a weatherman. The astro equivalent. Yeah. All right. What are you guys feeling? I guess we're, we're still in the midst of eclipse season, and is that Gemini solar eclipse on the 10th really the first thing and one of the main things we need to talk about? There's that, and then there's Mars back into a fixed sign, and Saturn and square I, Uranus. Yes. Yeah. So one one note before we get to those. So just before Mars moves back into or moves into Leo, back into a fixed sign, we have a a Mars Pluto opposition, um, which um, uh, Mar Mars Pluto gives like sh shady power dynamics, contention, anger, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't. I, uh, I don't want to make this too much about the U.S., um, but that um, <clears throat> that late Cancer is where the United States has in the Sibley chart has its natal Mercury, which is opposed Pluto natally. So that mm -hmm. that hits that point in the U.S. chart, and if it hits your chart closely, that might be an unpleasant couple days. But it's not something that we need to dwell on because there's more important stuff. Yeah, twenty six Capricorn and twenty six Cancer, twenty six of the cardinal signs is a sensitive point, and that's 
relevant because that aspect has been building since that, that lunar eclipse that we just spent a bunch of time talking about and the Mercury stationing retrograde, and it builds up and builds up and then goes exact here. It looks like June 5th, June 6th. Yeah, and then we have the solar eclipse just a few days later. Yeah, there it is. It looks like 19 Gemini, uh, solar eclipse, Mercury's retrograde at 20 degrees. So there's a close triple conjunction of the Sun, Moon, and Mercury between 19 and 20 degrees of Gemini. They are squaring Neptune at 23 Pisces, um, which gives a sort of otherworldly, illusory um, type feel to that eclipse, which is kind of an interesting signature to put together with it. Because Mercury and Gemini, and Gemini in general, is usually about facts and communication and, and exchange. Um, having Neptune squaring that at the same time is a contradictory sort of dynamic in some ways. Yeah, yes. Neptune, I, I would say, as far as Mercury is concerned, Neptune is a malefic. Right. Yeah, they, they do represent opposing principles or functions. So Mercury is never as clear or as specific or as organized when Neptune's about. I mean, on the other hand, so we, to give it a somewhat positive spin, like Mercury Neptune is great at building worlds and like fantasies and creating very vivid alternative realities or alternative facts in some way. Yes. Yeah, Fantasy it's good land. for it's good for writing poetry. It's not good for doing your taxes. Yeah. Good, good point. Or if you're like a fantasy, if you're like George R. R. Martin or something like that, and you want to create a whole uh, Game of Thrones fantasy world or something like that, but not as good if you're trying to count count coins or count numbers, like you, you're saying, Austin. Right, right. Yeah, there's uh, and so things like this. Um, this eclipse kicks off uh, things getting cooking again. You know, we've had some we've had some nice things with this Jupiter in Pisces, um, but things start to get complicated again, right? We have a solar eclipse on Rahu. It's uh, within a degree and a half of Mars in the Sibley chart. I'll say nothing more than that. But then Mars uh, just was it the day afterwards um, moves into Leo, and that's that puts Mars on another reactivation crash course with the Saturn Uranus square, which is also uh, tightening again too. Uh, I believe that Saturn and Uranus make another perfect square in June, just as Mars comes in to con contest with both of them, um, and you know feed that uh, already somewhat volatile configuration some gasoline. Yeah, that's yeah. something that I definitely have my eye on because, and this is it, what's interesting to note is that once Mars comes into Leo, it is setting up a pattern that runs through the middle of the year. So even though, you know, we'll look at like, you know, second quarter, third quarter, Mars in Leo is really like a June, July kind of vibe. And in very early July, Mars, Saturn, and Uranus will form the tightest by degree conjunction. So that's starting to build. It, it, it's, as we've said, it's an ongoing pattern throughout the year. It's not going to be new, but we're just getting some um, heat that we haven't seen quite, you know, with those three so close together. Um, oh, and there's a nice diagram to show this. Lovely diagram from Archetypal Explorer showing the Saturn Uranus, the second Saturn Uranus square peaking in mid June early to mid-June, and then those exact aspects that you're both talking about, the exact Mars-Saturn opposition on July 1st, and the exact Mars-Uranus square on July 3rd. So as soon as Mars moves into Leo here in June, that those aspects really start building up and start to percolate. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> I think as far as Uranus, Saturn as a um, civil unrest signature, um, or Uranus, yeah, Uranus and Saturn as a civil unrest signature. Um, Mars and uh, Mars and Leo isn't shy. Mars isn't shy. Period. But that's no. uh, that's that's you know Mars Mars and Leo is loud and proud, um, bold, brash. Yeah, there'll there'll be um, there'll be some action. 
um, especially towards the end of June, early July. Yeah, so, okay, Mars ingress is one of the things that happens, and that doesn't peak, but it's the, the tension starts building up and building up between then and July, pretty much the rest of June, once Mars goes into Leo. Um, we do get Jupiter stationing retrograde and changing course around June 21st, uh, which is notable and important because it's like the preview phase of Pisces starts to be over and it starts to change course and to head back because it has unfinished business to complete with Saturn and Aquarius. And this becomes the turning point where it's not gone and done with Pisces yet, but it starts heading in that direction, remembering that it it forgot something with its old roommate and landlord back in Aquarius. Yeah, when you can see the um, as testified to by other planets, uh, you can see some of that expansive, hopeful, like oh, this you know maybe this can go in a good direction or maybe this is workable. You can see some of that optimism uh, disagreed with by you know Mars, Saturn, Uranus, and so it's entirely fitting that Jupiter's like oh, all right, I'm going to head on home or I'm I'm going to head. Uh, it's not quite time for this. Um, there's you know. There's more of there's more of that to do. There's more work to be done in Aquarius. Yeah. All right. Um, so that's bringing us then, I th believe, into July. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So third quarter. Here is okay. the calendar for July. As we good point, we're beginning the third quarter at this point. So we've got lunation, new moon on the 9th of July in Cancer. Mercury goes into Cancer on the 11th. A um, bunch of other ingresses. Full moon in Aquarius on the 23rd. Uh, major one is Jupiter returning back to making a retrograde ingress back into Aquarius on the 28th. And then Mars almost simultaneously shifting and moving out of Leo and into Virgo on the 29th. Um, other major things about July or other major points we meant to mention, aside from how tense it looks very early in the month when that Mars, uh, those Mars aspects are going exact with Mars squaring Uranus and opposing Saturn in early July. Yeah, I think we've covered that. And then it's the it's a month ha that has a really different vibe at the start and the end because at the start Mars is with Saturn and Uranus just, you know, pouring gasoline on a fire essentially. But at the very end of the month, Mars and Jupiter will oppose each other just as they're both about to change signs. Yeah, so super tense at the beginning of the month and then you pointed out Mars and Jupiter oppose right before right right as they're changing signs. Right, I remember when we were doing we were preparing for this. That was such a notable shift because we see Mars, you know, headed out of Leo and into Virgo, and we see Jupiter walking backwards uh, from Pisces into Aquarius, and both pretty much simultaneously change signs at the same time and oppose each other as they're going in opposite directions into those different signs. So here is Mars completing the opposition with uh, Jupiter from 29 degrees of Leo to 29 degrees of Aquarius. It looks like they complete that on the 29th of July. Yes, right at the tail end of the month. Whether so, that's enough to create a little bit of a positive lift or whether that's just more of you know the fire and the fight and the passion, I'm not sure. Right. Like a parting shot of Mars out of the fixed signs. I think it's less contentious than let's say the first third of the month. It, it I don't necessarily think it will be creating great peace uh, on Earth, no. um, but Mars Jupiter is less contentious than Mars Saturn Uranus. Yes, that's a good point. And then also with Jupiter, you know, regressing back into Aquarius, it's like it's coming back. To bring the peace into the fixed signs where there's been the most tension, especially in early July and late June, with Mars moving through Leo and Saturn and Uranus squaring each other again for a second time. But then it's like sort of buddy Jupiter 
returns back to Aquarius and sort of perhaps tells everybody to start settling down. And simultaneously, Mars moves on and removes some of the antagonism um, that it was bringing to the table as it was moving through Leo. So Mars starts moving through Virgo by late July, early August. Mm-hmm. And Venus has preceded Mars into Virgo um, by what about ten days? Yeah, or a week. And so, yeah, we have the shifting out of. Um, of of fixed signs and into that mute, more mutable, calculating, analytical Virgo for both Venus and then a week later Mars. Mm. Yeah, and of course, since it's July, we get the Sun moving into Leo, uh, July twenty first, twenty second, and Mercury moves into Leo by the twenty seventh, twenty eighth. Um, so I don't know. This feels a little bit like a cleaning up of some of the, the tensions and the conflict and things that were happening in the fixed signs up to this point. So that we, once Mars gets out of Leo, we've made it through one of the tenser parts of the year, um, which I think we had identified. Mars going through the the three fixed signs it moves through this year being some of the more tense parts of the year, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's still one more to come. Yeah, right. The yeah. best gets the best Scorpio. to save for last. Yes. Yeah, and the sun in Leo, I think this is setting up um, a pattern that we're now going to deal with for a couple of years, which is planets in Leo opposing Saturn. We've already had planets in Leo squaring Uranus. So it's just creating – the sun in Leo can definitely work to try and stabilize things. It's part of the nature of the sun is this steady, constant light relative to the other planets. And it's the sun in a fixed sign. So it is that sense of like how can we um, maybe solidify our ground here. But the sun will have to negotiate with Saturn. And that's, that's an interesting opposition because – uh, we have both planets in in domicile or in in one of their home signs while they're you know standing on opposing sides of a topic. That I think that aspect is technically into early August. Yeah, it looks like August first. Yeah. The Sun conjoins Mercury at nine degrees of Leo and opposes Saturn at ten degrees of Aquarius. So it, it is a repetition of what we saw with Mars in early July, but with the Sun and Mercury in early August. And even though it is activating Saturn Uranus again, it's uh, the Sun's the Sun's fire is less extreme than Mars. So this mm-hmm. is probably going to be revisiting whatever uh, whatever the issues were, but from a somewhat more moderate angle, I don't necessarily know that it'll be pleasant, but it'll be um, you know it will be it will be less uh, it will be less intense and the passions will be less violent than uh, when Mars was activating all that. Yeah, it strikes me, you know, thinking about the some of the concepts of like a planet in their home sign and and even just the idea of, the sun having a, a potentially steadying influence and Saturn being more thoughtful and, and long, um, long-term long focus, it seems like it, there is still the tension there. It, it's not that heat of a fight or a revolt. It's we disagree, but we have to work through this disagreement in more of a, a maybe measured or perhaps mature way. Yeah, yeah. I see, yeah. like uh, in some, like Game of Thrones terms, right? It's, it's like we have the the monarch or the king or queen as the son, like negotiating with the leader of the rebellion, um, with Saturn and Aquarius, right? The outsiders yeah. versus the sun at the at the center. But there, there's a more negotiating quality there rather than um, blatant contention, like we get uh, with Mars. With Mars, yeah. Absolutely. And what else do you want to say about August, Austin? What are your highlights for that month? I would say that, you know, once we get past that um, that sun's opposition to Saturn and then the sun's square with Uranus, which happens really early in the month, right? Like the sun is is done with that. 
um, yes, at done the with start exact of the month, aspect. For sure. Yeah, by the end of the first full week, the you know end of the first seven days, like that's that one's in the books. Um, and I think that um, one will get more generally positive solar stuff. Um, one nice thing about Jupiter back in Aquarius is as Mercury and the Sun. Um, head towards the end of Leo, they both get to make an aspect to Jupiter. Mm. And it's not it's not Jupiter and Pisces, but it's still like it's still a, a constructive, like, okay, well, what can be done to improve things? Um, and then we have that, you know, that Mars and Venus in uh, Virgo for a while, which is much more analytical, right? It's mm. much more it's much more like, well, let's let's think about this. And then once we get to the middle of the month, we get one of, um, I think, one of your favorite things and one of my favorite things. Yeah, it's like the second really juicy thing from a benefic perspective, which is Venus coming into Libra. And, you know, this is the first time in three years where Venus can enjoy being in Libra without a square from Capricorn. And uh, so we're going to see a period, if you like, of uh, perhaps – attempt to create connection or find common ground. It might allow for more constructive uh, planning or connections within our personal dynamics, and we might see that play out collectively as well. But we have a benefit coming into a, another one of its home signs, which this is another one of those, like, here's what's a little bit better about 2021 than what we had in 2020 is, is we can we can actually get Venus in Libra and and get some of the potential goodness coming through from that. I like that. So one of our themes this year is um, in 2021 is the benefics suddenly in certain spots. It's not the entire year, but in some spots of the year, the the benefics are less encumbered or more unencumbered than they were in 2020. Where even the bright spots of 2020, there was always something sort of overshadowing it as an overarching thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that. Um, Insofar as dispute and contention um, is going to be a big theme, of spots of big dispute and contention um, will be a continuing theme throughout 2021. Um, an unencumbered Venus in Libra allows for some negotiations, some truces, some agreements um, to be arrived at, right? Like Venus in Libra is very much a peacemaker. Um, you know, with the with the symbol of Libra being the scales, it's you know in both commerce and uh, in society, the ideal solution is what is fair, right? Mm. And uh, Venus in Libra does a nice job of trying to negotiate things that are fair. Look at Venus um, forming. One of the side effects of that is that it starts forming trines. These very yeah. nice superior. Overcoming trines, like uh, when it gets to eight degrees of Libra on August twenty second, it trines Saturn at eight degrees of Aquarius, and then eventually later, once it gets to about 24, 25 degrees of Libra in early September, it forms a trine with Jupiter. Mm -hmm. and so both of those are quite nice aspects, and I particularly like the Venus Saturn one because there's a lot of uh, um, sort of positive, I don't know, connection there. I mean, I think about Venus being in the sign of Saturn's exaltation, Saturn being dignified, Venus being dignified. There's a real sense of two people that have negotiating power or have the ability to create deals or sweeten it. Like there's that sense of let's come together and we can make something happen because we have the tools we need at the right time to put something together. Yeah, especially like yeah, I think, socially I think deal and intellectually. Is, yeah, like let the like Venus, yeah, Venus and Libra is ready to make deals. Yeah. Yes. So that's which is that's a, a nice counter. Nice yeah. It's a nice counterpoint to the rather ferociously analytical Mercury Mars um conjunction that we have in Virgo during the second yes. half of the month. Right, which is just so um you know, Mercury is going to dominate there, so it's going to be more rational than furious, right? If when, if Mars got to lead, then it would be you know more aggressive than uh, analytic. But it's Mercury's domain, but it's still like ferocious analysis, 
And so yeah, this, Venus being in Libra is a nice counterpoint to that. To that. Is, yeah, that, looks, that's, sorry, Chris. Is Mercury moving fast? Yeah, Mer- Mercury's moving fast during this p- period in mid-August when it conjoins Mars. So you, you could say, using your keyword, Austin, uh, for Furious for Mars, could we say it's the the fast and the furious? Is that the mid, oh. mid-August? Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Nicely done, Chris. Thank you. Um, so that conjunction's on the 18th of August at 12 degrees of Virgo, Mercury, and Mars. Yeah, and I also think about that as being something technical or mechanical or something mm-hmm. with a scientific um, component, a, a diagnostic or a, uh, a system. You know, the, the Virgo is this, we, we say the master analyst, but Virgo loves to solve problems. And, you know, putting those two planets together, um, there's definitely a lot of overthinking, but knowing that Mercury has just got the upper hand here, can we get some sort of tangible solution or decision or outcome from this? Yeah. That's so good. yeah, I, I regard very... Mercury Mars as an engineering um, That's combination. The word. Yes. And this is a very positive interpretation here of Mercury and Mars, partially because it's mitigated since there's some reception between Mercury and Mars, with Mars being in Mercury's domicile. Um, but even at that, and as well as some innovation, actually, because if you look, they're both trining Uranus at the same time at 14 degrees of Taurus. So, like mechanical innovation or technological innovation or something like that, um, you know, it still can be Mercury Mars conjunction can still be a little bit divisive of an aspect in terms of mentioning that in mid mid August. Although it's not as bad as the three Mercury retrograde squares that we had earlier in the year, or the Mercury yeah. retrograde, the Mercury Mars aspects that will come up later in the year. <laughs> This is right. probably one of the most productive Mercury Mars aspects for the year, I think. Mm, nice. Yeah, yeah I think point. that's right. All and right. Then by the end of the month, Mercury has ingressed into Libra. And so we have a, a, a short period where we have both Mercury and Venus in Libra. Nice. I like Which that. Which is kind of nice. We'll enjoy that for the for the for the few days that we have it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really nice pocket. I think that was the word I was searching for earlier. Uh, There's just some nice benefic pockets uh, in different parts of this year. Yeah, and we get the Mercury-Saturn aspect before Mars comes in too, which is nice. Yeah, the trine from 7 degrees of Libra to 7 degrees of Aquarius on September 4th, it looks like. Mm -hmm. Mercury trine Saturn, and that's simultaneous almost with Venus trining Jupiter a couple days later. Um, so that's all very nice, very positive social movement, um, positive social exchanges and, and things like that, interactions. Um, I can see Mars wanting to crash the party though, as it's getting it's inching closer and closer closer to the end of Virgo and the beginning of Libra. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah, that is and that's, the next big story. Yeah, that's really the the shift, right? We go from Venus unencumbered in Libra with a little help from, you know, little 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 friendly conversation with Mercury to our next phase, right? Which is going to begin middle of the month where Venus moves into Scorpio, which is a fixed sign, so we'll uh, activate Saturn Uranus again. Um and Mars moves into Libra. And so um we we go from Venus Mercury uh, in Libra to Mercury Mars, and because all of our, um, our Mercury retrogrades this year are in air signs, um, we're going to have a lot of Mercury Mars in Libra. And so, one of the things that I was thinking about is that we have this—you know—we have all these nice things happen in Libra, and then we have a lot of contentious stuff happen in Libra. And Mm -hmm. so some of those agreements, some of those deals, some of those uh, peace accords and truces are going to get torn up. Um, Some of them will make it through, but there's uh, a lot of the, a lot of those accords will not last uh, into the fall or very far into the fall. So we are in September at this point. Here is the artwork for those watching the video version for September, Newman and Virgo on the 6th, Venus ingresses into Scorpio on the 10th, 
Mars goes into Libra, completing that shift that Austin was just talking about on the 14th. Uh, full moon in Pisces on the 20th. And then the other notable thing is Mercury stationing retrograde on the 27th of September. Yes. And so we're then we're doing Mercury and Mars in Libra, which is, as you said, Austin, it's sort of pulling apart what was done earlier and it's bringing back that uh, contentious disagreement, dispute um, quality of Mercury and Mars, which until we kind of sat down and went through it, I hadn't quite, you know, really got my head around how often we're going to see that next year. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's certainly one of the features. But yeah, I I, I guess um, yeah. one way to say it with the Merc with the 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 lovely Venus in Libra shifting into the um, Mercury, the extended Mercury Mars co presence in Libra is a lot of the accords, deals, you know, uh, uh, um, um, points of balance. Um, get that Venus creates uh, or facilitates get challenged significantly um, Mm. in the following period. And some of them will come through just fine, but some of them won't. So some deals are off that we thought were made earlier with Venus and Libra. Yeah. 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 Um, So that retrograde, it was funny because I'm looking at the course of that retrograde Mercury, and it looks like the focal point is around that new moon and just after it that happens in Libra in early October. I don't know if that's getting ahead or if that's okay to look at it as a continuous story. Um, But look at this. Well, we have a break before we talk about October. Okay, right, right. Yes, yeah. Stay away from October. The one thing I just, yeah, the the Mercury, Mars, and then the Sun – the thing that I had was this constant debating, this back and forward, the negotiating, the renegotiating, just really struggling to find agreement. So separate to, you know, how things may come undone from earlier or what have you, and some things will hold, but there also this sense of what's coming forward as a new development, perhaps in this late latter part of September has got more disagreement around it. Yeah, definitely, and it ha- it has to do with revisiting something. Since Mercury stays in that sign, and it starts retreading those steps, and then it hits Mer- hits Mars. Um, by the end of September, there's just something that that people or some people have to return back to and revisit and revise. Um, perhaps that's contentious, but that you thought was finished and you were going to move on from, but you end up having to come back to it. Yeah, well, you'll notice that Mercury stations retrograde um, just after a trine to Jupiter. Yeah. So we're we're going to be rethinking what seems like, oh, this is great. Um, and as September ends, we're really just beginning um, this Mercury uh, Mercury Mars co presence, which is going to take us through a lot of October. It's going to take at least another three weeks for that to play out. Um, and so we're just starting as the equinox comes, we're just starting or comes and then passes. We're just starting to be like, well, maybe, maybe this isn't going to work. Yeah. That's so funny. Cause it's like Mercury is direct in September 18th, it trines Jupiter and you're like, this is great. Let's move on. And Mercury keeps moving forward. But then all of a sudden it does a U-turn, um, stations retrograde at 25, Libra starts moving backwards and then it hits Saturn a second or it hits Jupiter trying a second time. So it's like, this is still great, even though we're going back and revising things. But then there's something looming ahead in the future in Mars that uh, comes towards the later part or the mid part of the retrograde cycle. Yeah, there's a point of contention that needs to be taken into consideration before, um, before clear movement forward can take place. Or not a uh, lasting movement forward. Yeah. Okay. One, uh, um, any are there any other things we need to mention? I know Venus opposes Uranus a few days later. Mercury also squares Pluto before we wrap up September and, and go into second break and final quarter. I think the big stuff is is into October at this point. And the last quarter is interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so shall we um let me do our spot then before we take our break, or maybe mm-hmm. I'll do it once we get back. Sure. Let's do it. 
Let's do it once, wait, wait, once we get back. Let's take okay. a break because I know it's been a while. Okay, great. So let's yeah, take I'm a quick starting five. to trance out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So five minute break, everybody. Get refueled and uh, take a little walk or something like that, and then we'll be back in like five minutes. Perfect. Do some jumping cool. jacks. Yeah. Throw some punches <laughs> at the air. All right, so we're back and we're getting ready to go into the final quarter of the year. Uh, I wanted to mention really quickly our uh, second sponsor for this episode, our second and last sponsor, which is the Mountain Astrologer magazine. Uh, so the Mountain Astrologer is one of the world's most respected and widely circulated astrological magazines. It's been in business for over 30 years, and um, it's been a staple of the community for quite a while. They have both a print magazine that's in major bookstores like Barnes and & Noble and, and sometimes in Whole Foods and stuff like that. They also have an online version or a digital version that you can read online as a PDF. Um, it's a really great magazine, especially for beginner and intermediate students. And I always recommend it to people uh, just because um, it can give you sort of a broad overview of a number of different astrological traditions where TMA is kind of like the astrology podcast in that it's very inclusive and they try to um, bring in a bunch of different astrologers under one roof um, in their magazine pretty regularly. I think all of us have written articles for TMA at, at one point or another, right? Yes. Yeah, I believe I have. so. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, uh, they I interviewed Tem Terica, the founder, um, in 2018 in episode 149 before he passed away last year. TMA has since been taken over by a new team uh, with some people that were on previously and some new people, and I'm excited in some of the directions that they're taking the magazines. So, um, not only do I think it's a really great product for astrologers, but it's something good to support in the community to have both digital and print publications that talk about current events in the same way that the Astrology Podcast does. So you can subscribe to it either in the print version or digitally at mountainastrologer.com. All right, why don't we jump into the final quarter of the year and get right into October. So um, let me put up the calendar for the year for October. And we're pretty much talking about the continuation and the next phase of the Mercury retrograde conjunct Mars at this point, right? Yes. Yeah, there, there's still a lot of distance between them, but that's what's begun, right? Mercury has turned around, has started heading back towards Mars. Mars is heading forward. There's, um, there's some uh, unease where there was, um, where there was grace and harmony only weeks before. Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, so, in terms of the main things this month, um, the Mercury retrograde, the halfway point through that cycle is on the 9th. Saturn stations direct on the 10th. Jupiter and Mercury station direct simultaneously on the 18th. And Mars goes into Scorpio on the 30th. So, what other things do we need to touch on in terms of we have the continuation of that cycle and the culmination of it in terms of Mercury stationing and Mercury conjoining Mars and the contentiousness of that. I guess that's one of the major signatures of the first part of October. Yeah, and that actually takes a little while to play out. Um, you know, we've got they're they're moving closer and closer together, and in our on our new moon on the sixth, we have Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury. All together, right? So whatever that that challenge to accord and equilibrium is, um, will be very clear at that point. And that new moon tells us that that's going to be uh, it's going to be a big theme, right? And what's interesting is all these planets in Libra are making that same pair of trines to Saturn and Jupiter, right? So all of this is. Um, all of this action, just like uh, Venus and Libra, it's all sort of informed by and informing the larger shape of things, which Jupiter and Saturn are responsible for. That makes sense. Um, so I see that new moon, 13 degrees of Libra, exactly conjunct Mars on the 6th. Um, and then not very long after that, we get Mercury retrograde uh, conjoining Mars as well, it looks like on the what is the exact date? Sorry. A few days later, it looks like it's 16 degrees of Libra around October 9th. Yeah, yeah and so then that's they all, start to that's all come apart. Sorry, you go. 
What were you saying, Kelly? Oh, no. you go? Just that they then then we get at least a little bit of a breathing room where Mercury is now separating from Mars after that date. It's not perfect, but it just turns the heat or the volume down a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we get the separation of that. Um, Mercury eventually stations direct around October 18th. And it's kind of interesting that Jupiter is stationing direct simultaneously at 22 degrees of Aquarius on the same date. Um, so that seems positive to me. That seems like some a little bit of resolution and a little bit of moving forward again after a contentious and somewhat um, confusing period with the Mercury retrograde. Well, I think that we need um, we need to get to the full moon in Aries, which yeah. is just a basically a day later, which opposes yeah. that Mars as well as the Sun. Mm. Yeah, one one day later on October nineteenth, it looks like the full moon takes place. Uh, is it twenty six or twenty seven, Kelly? It's uh, probably twenty seven, actually. Yeah, twenty seven Aries opposite that Sun-Mars conjunction. So there's a little bit of heat and volatility there in that lunation as well. Okay. Uh, so 27 on October 20th, 27 degrees of Aries opposite to Mars. Mercury is now stationed direct at this point, and Jupiter is direct at 22. Aquarius trining, kind of helping out a little bit or making a, a wide sextile to the Moon at 27 from 22 degrees of Aquarius. Um, but yeah, it's still a, still a tense full moon opposition with Mars. Yeah, it's got that square to Pluto kind of just in the mix. That well, the Mars square Pluto aspect is building, and the lunation kind of spotlights that a little bit. Yeah, right. I would agree that Jupiter's trying to help, and will be able to help somewhat. It's it's very very uh, classically Libran in symbolism, right? It's like well, there's this and there's that and. Can, you know, can we keep this from toppling over? You know, maybe we need to move this from the side of the scales. Like, it, it's um, uh, what's the word? Um, it's it's a little um, like when something is. What do you what What's the word when something is prone to topple, but maybe it can stay balanced? Like, it's a little precarious, mm. um, but not doomed. <laughs> Yeah, um, Saturn also stationing this month. It gets as far back into the early degrees of Aquarius at six degrees as it's going to get. So um, people that have placements in the early degrees of the first decan of Saturn, this is uh, the last sort of pass as it's going to get as early in that sign, and then it'll start moving forward again. Um, all right, that brings us basically to the end of the month, where the last major thing is we get the shift of Mars into Scorpio on October 30th, and thus commences the final pass of the tense, like fixed sign transits that are going to take place this year. And this will take us through into November. Yeah, we get Sun. Um, into Scorpio on the twenty, was it twenty second, and then Mars about a week behind, and that is um, that that sets us up to take a, a big strong look at the Saturn Uranus. <laughs> We're going to yes. feed the Saturn Uranus square yet again, <laughs> and it yeah, that's November is definitely a month with. <laughs> <laughs> it's like where do we start? Uh, well, we well, get another. I, I'll start with. Yeah, you okay? Okay, I'll just say November is my least favorite month of 2021. Wow. Uh, okay, that's it's a bold big, statement. Big words. Um, I can see we were trying to look for elections. We were, we wanted to do a like a Mars and Scorpio election during November, but it's like you can't because you run into one of the main signatures of November, which is as soon as Mars goes into Scorpio, it starts applying to this. Tight square with Saturn at seven degrees of Aquarius, and after it clears Saturn, um, it starts opposing Uranus at twelve degrees of Taurus. So that is that is the tension I think that you're talking about that that T square this this month. That is that's an important component of it, um, and so yeah, this is it's the you know what we're doing is uh, is the same feeding that Saturn Uranus uh, square Mars. As, as well as a few other planets again, but Mars most importantly for the inflaming the tensions and hostilities, uh, just like we're going to do in January with Mars and Taurus. And um, 
early uh late june um first part of july with mars and uh leo and then here we are one last time this year with mars and scorpio we also have the sun squaring the you know uh hitting the same aspects with the mm. planets and then mercury is going to catch up to mars and so we're we're basically going to do sun mars mercury all in sequence uh, uh hitting that saturn uranus square and yeah, look, uh, we have a nice little eclipse at the end. Look at that Mercury Mars conjunction at seven degrees of Scorpio squaring Saturn at seven degrees of Aquarius. Um, that's a tense, tense little aspect, a little fireball aspect. Yeah, it is. Um, yes, it is. Okay. And so, one thing that we can say is um, those pe the those peaceful accords. Um, that didn't make it through October are likely to get very nasty in November. Mm. Okay, so um, you already mentioned so this takes us into back into eclipse season, and one of the notable changes that brings in something brand new here at the very end of the year, towards the end of the year, is we get our very first eclipse in a fixed sign. So the eclipses start shifting as the nodes inch closer and closer to Scorpio and Taurus, and we get a Taurus lunar eclipse on the 19th of November. Which is adding uh, agitation into the fixed sign places. And this is also going to be the first eclipse across that axis that will then take us into 2022. So it's a, it's a little bit of a transition in the eclipse story, but just further stirring up some of the fixed signs, not Aquarius, but Scorpio Taurus. Yeah. So major culmination of events in fixed signs at the end of the year after this year of tension in fixed signs um, between Saturn and Uranus, but also between Mars and Saturn and Uranus, and occasionally Mercury. Um, so that's going to set up this culmination in the fixed sign of Taurus is going to set up um, a sequence or, or a, a domino effect then as we move into 2022, where the fixed signs start becoming even more of the focus. Yeah. And so this is a this is sort of a, a premature. Uh, this is a, this is in a sense this eclipse is a a sneak peek, uh, literally a foreshadowing of the 2022 eclipse cycle. Um, the solar eclipse two weeks after this will be in Sag, and we've been doing Gemini and Sag for a while at this point. But this Taurus one, like you said, like you both said, foreshadows the the 2022 eclipses, and this one is particularly um, worrisome because it is um, it, mm. it's an eclipse within a degree of Caput Algol. Um, which is one of the the gnarliest fixed stars, um, and historically um, is uh, uh, is a, an, an indicator of some nasty business. And so, with that happening uh, in the same time frame as the the Mars activation of the Saturn Uranus, um, that's why November wins my worst month of 2021 award. Mm, okay. Um, it looks like it's squaring Jupiter at the same time at 24 Aquarius. I don't know if that's helping it's at all. A little it's helpful. helpful. It's trying. It's doing its best. It will doing get a, its best. What is that that you get in school? That's like a when you, award for when you tried. You didn't like come in first or anything. A it's participation a part award or something. Yes, Jupiter is oh. getting a participation trophy in November. Well, at um, least he's not farting at the assembly. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's um, true. All right, so I think that is going to take us then into headlong into our final month of the year of 2021 as we move into December. Here's the image for December. Um, so we have Neptune stationing direct on the first in Pisces. We have a solar eclipse in Sagittarius on the 4th of December. Mars moves into Sagittarius on the 13th, and Mercury into Capricorn on the same day. A full moon in Gemini on the 18th, Venus stationing retrograde on the 19th, 
Uh, the sun into Capricorn, of course, as it does every time that year on the 21st, and the third and final Saturn-Uranus uh, square on the 24th of December, followed by Jupiter finally making its full and final ingress into Pisces on the 28th of December and completing its year-long trek through Aquarius. So this is our yeah. last, our final chapter of the year, which is pretty packed and pretty notable, just like December of 2020 was, um, it looks like, right, Kelly? Yeah, that's what really strikes me is that December of 2020 was sort of like the end of the year that had been, but mm -hmm. also the start of what was to come with Jupiter and Saturn ingressing into Aquarius. And we see a little bit of that in December 2021 again, where we do have the final Saturn-Uranus aspect that's exact to the minute, not just by degree, but to the minute. But Jupiter does make its ingress into the next sign where it's going to spend the first five months or so of 2022. And we have the start of Venus retrograde, which is going to carry us into the first few months of 2022 as well. So it, it December really feels like wrapping up what's been going on all year, but also already diving headlong into the cycles that will cross us, that will carry us across the threshold of the calendar year. Yeah, I I, I like that because the calendar, as we've talked about before, doesn't always line up with the astrology, and often the astrology is. Not in alignment with the calendar, and the calendar is more arbitrary than the astrology is. But this is another one of those years, like with 2020, where for some reason the astrology is lining up kind of cleanly with the calendar. Yeah, it's it's kind of helpful from a planning purposes when it does happen, but it doesn't. 2022, it won't happen because Jupiter is going to change signs in the middle of the year just to throw us off. But uh, that's okay. One of the things I wanted to ask you guys about is um, so here's an image with um, from Archetypal Explorer with the three exact Saturn Uranus aspects or squares, and the third and final exact one goes exact on December 24th, um, which is a nice way to end the year. Uh, well, nice, it's a culmination of that in some sense, having the third and final one, but. <clears throat> more widely, it's like that aspect, even though it doesn't go exact again, it's going to come back. Really close. Um, and yeah. yeah, it comes it, really it's close. It's not over. So it's not over. No. So that's why I wanted to ask you is how much can we treat and like, I don't want to say be optimistic, but how much can we treat this as something that is a final culmination in the third and final exact aspect on December 24th versus how much can we not do that because Uranus will retrograde back or Saturn will retrograde back and get so close to Uranus again during the course of 2022? Yeah, I think we can't even. I, I think it would be folly to treat it as if it were over. They spend they spend nearly a month um, in squared degrees in 2022, and mm. the eclipse cycle will have moved on so that uh, you know half of the eclipses uh, are happening in Taurus. Um, right on that Uranus. Um, and so I think that the dynamics described by the Saturn uh, Uranus square um, just run, they run right into and through 2022. Okay. So what we're looking at is like waves of revolution or waves of change um, that keep coming and maybe are at their most rocky in some ways um, and distinct in 2021, but they're going to continue on into 2022. Well, I need to spend more time with it, but I might bet on 2022 to be more rocky than 2021. Okay. Um, what else um, in terms of the eclipse that happened early in the month? Do you? Yeah, do either December. Of you, yeah, that that Sagittarius eclipse, similar to the Sagittarius eclipse that's taking place or just took place in December of 2020. Um, obviously, in a different degree, but that, will that be the completion of that eclipse series then in? In Sagittarius and Gemini, does it move entirely to fixed signs in 2022? Kelly is fur yeah, furiously <laughs> looking through her I ephemeris. Was, yeah, I'm madly page flipping. We do. Uh, it is the last. Yes, it is the last. Okay, so we have the the completion of the Sagittarius Gemini eclipse series, and then that's it. So the so after this point, at least certainly by six months later into 2022, we'll get the full shift into fixed signs and then the changes and the new beginnings and endings and culminations indicated by the Eclipse series in Sag and Gemini will come to a completion. Yeah, because the nodes will change in early 2022 as well, which I think is 
um, something that Austin's got his eye on. So yeah, this will be the end of the Gemini Sag eclipse cycle this go round. Okay. Early December. Let me take a look at that eclipse. Um, Austin, you won the debate. I wanted to say a year later. I can say this about the uh, the eclipse that occurred in December of like t- we were looking at it in December of 2019, but it ended oh. up no, no, it it occurred in December of 2019. It was the eclipse that set up, um, and it was conjunct Jupiter in Capricorn. Um, and I was hoping for some like optimism with Jupiter there be- being there with the eclipse, but you were like, no, this does not look does not look pretty and it turned out like as we were speaking there was this virus that was like developing um you know in in different parts of the world that then would like just completely eclipse and come out onto the world stage and eclipse everything for the next 6 months between that eclipse in december and the next one that would take place i guess in like may or june so good good call i owe you, i should we should have bet on that or something <laughs> well, at the well, time well thank you like, that's very gracious that yeah. was yeah that was the christmas day eclipse that was the right. the what i'd proposed as a good time to give birth to the antichrist yes and apparently right. a petri dish or some you know some sort of um <laughs> bioreactor back to <laughs> bring it back bio um, yes something something terrible grew uh but yes thank you that's very gracious I am not above admitting when I'm wrong, and and I'll give that one to you. So this eclipse, um, how are we feeling about this eclipse? It looks like it's happening at 12 degrees of Sagittarius on December 3rd, December 4th. Um, Mercury is there. It's direct in Sagittarius at the same time. Mars is at 23, Scorpio squaring Jupiter at 25, which is not terrible. Sort of mixed bag goes either way. But we do have one of the major things um, that's happening in December, of course, is the Venus retrograde, where it stations retrograde conjunct Pluto, and that is a, a distinctive and interesting like aspect forming around that time. Well, it, yeah, Venus spends think, a, about ahead. a month with v, with Pluto, I think, just because she slows right down almost to his pace. That there's this drawn out Venus Pluto signature that that comes through. Yeah, so that that is one of the signatures of the month of December. Then is the Venus Pluto conjunction, which is not a terribly the Venus Pluto pairing in Capricorn is not terribly upbeat. <laughs> no, that's a very intense like, you know the there's the like high versions of being in love, and then there's the depths of your soul type versions of being in love, which is the gut churning uh heart ripping out version which which sometimes venus pluto can be more coinciding with or sometimes the obsessive versions of that yeah definitely and then in capricorn it's just sort of like i, I um it's a it's sort of we could say it's depressive it's just like oh you know if, if it's you know if, if venus um sort of shows us what there is to enjoy um at a given point um, Pluto, Pluto doesn't offer too many delights. Occasionally, you know, there's a, a well lit under, underworld scene, but it's it's uh, it's pretty downbeat. Um, but to go back to you asked me about the eclipse or brought up the solar eclipse. Yeah, you know, it's just another one of these, right? You know, we we just did one just now. It's not you know super tightly configured with anything dramatic. Um, it's not too far from Antares, so that gives it, um, you know, that that gives it a more martial and contentious quality. Um, but you know, Mars is still in Scorpio, so martial and contentious. Um, you know, what's interesting is if we, you know, we look at like the these sort of inflammatory points with Mars earlier in November. Um, those fires don't really go out. Um, they're not um, in the process of ignition by the time we get to December. Um, but we have the eclipse near a very martial star. Mars is still in <clears throat> in Scorpio. And then even as we even later in the month when we get Mars into Sagittarius, um, we've got a Mars south node conjunction, mm. which also inflames Mars. And then um it's Mars moving into conjunction with Antares, you know, another martial star. So we don't really um again those there's not a whole lot to to fully put out those fires maybe that's um 
you know, maybe maybe Jupiter and Pisces will dump the ocean on them at the very end of the year. Um, but there's, you know, uh, there, there's a continuation from the uh, from the the November Mars stuff into December. Yeah, there's uh, yeah, there's just so much like Jupiter and the Pisces um, at the very end of the month, which is actually very nice, somewhat hopeful. But we're still going through the Venus retrograde. The Venus retrograde has already only just started um, when we're ending the year. Uh, and there's also a full moon as Venus is stationing direct there, uh, full moon in Gemini right. as the station is happening. Stationing retrograde? Uh, Venus is stationing retrograde, right? Yes. Right. Retrograde, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, so, so Venus retrograde in Capricorn conjunct Pluto. Any other Venus conjunct Pluto retrograde like archetypes or themes? Kelly, what does that bring to mind for you? I mean, I also think about the fact that it's happening in Capricorn, which is a sign where there can be a real feeling of being bound because of the Saturn mm. rulership. So right. when you put that kind of compulsion of Pluto with the bound quality of Capricorn, there is a, and that's sometimes how we get the manifestation of things like maybe obsession or compulsion, where it's just you're sort of bound or controlled by the desire or the craving. And I mean, that can, it's, it, there is an extreme extreme imbalance if you like because we're we're very focused intensely obsessively on one or two specific things and there is definitely a melancholy what is that face about <laughs> uh just you keep using the word bound and it's like uh thinking that it's giving me the the image of like that book or the movie um 50 shades of gray so this is like the 50 shades of gray oh, venus gosh. retrograde okay <laughs> Maybe that wasn't quite the context that I was I using that, it. But. I thought that was where you're going with it, but let's maybe we'll. we'll you told we'll me see. earlier this was a family show. That's um, a good point. All right, thank you for reminding me. I was thinking more like, well, I'm now wanted to say chains, but not in a sexual way, just in <laughs> okay. like a um, a restrained kind of. This is not getting any better. Okay. Yeah, let's back it up. We All can right. move on. <laughs> So Venus retrograde conjunct Pluto, we got the eclipse in Sagittarius, um, the last of the Saturn-Uranus exact hits and the peak of destabilization at the same time. But then do we get the optimi optimistic note, because let's leave this on some sort of optimism with Jupiter moving back into Pisces. And the little preview that we had earlier in the year that was just like the taste of freedom of Jupiter dipping into Pisces, but then possibly things going a little bit awry with Mercury squaring uh, Neptune at the same time. I wonder if this is not the forward-thinking, positive, optimistic thing that we have to look forward to, to the extent that there's some things to look forward to in 2022. What do you guys think? I mean, yeah, I think that Jupiter in Pisces just just before um, the vulgar New Year. It's a little bit of like we might just make it despite all of this. We might just make it. It's especially worth getting to the end of the year. Especially for my two Pisces friends here, um, I assume you're looking forward to that. And also with the eclipses shifting out of the mutable signs and some of the instability and changes that that would have, I would think that um, things are looking much better uh, for mutable signs as we move into 2022. Yes. Oh I yeah, I think I'd have to. It's 100 the rest of agree. you that I'm worried about. Yes. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> we'll fixed be signs. fine. It's everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, no. Fixed signs like myself with the Scorpio stellium or other fixed signs. We still got a long haul ahead of us, and and to the extent that last year was, you know, the Capricorn time of troubles, we're moving into the more firmly into the fixed sign uh, time of troubles after this, but. I'm happy at least for the Pisces and other mutable signs, Gemini, Virgo, and Sagittarius. And I think, yeah, that that we we touched on this earlier when we talked about Jupiter and Pisces, but it, it will bring a return to more Jupiter type things in general, because once Jupiter makes this shift, he doesn't have to hang out with Saturn for quite some time. So, you know, Jupiter is is free from Saturn for quite yeah. a while. So a return yeah, back that, to that's what over. happened. The shift that happened in December of 2019 when Jupiter went into Capricorn and a return back to what was happening before then when Jupiter was in Sagittarius. And I think we can all sort of think back to and, and remember and imagine what that was like. I'm hoping 
that by 2022 we can have like an in-person astrology conference again is one of my like long-term hopes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Kelly, are you hoping to like fly to Australia? You you've been completely yeah. gra- grounded this year. Yeah, it'll, and I've I've said almost from the get-go I'm like it'll be 2022 and I just prepped my family managed expectations and and as you mentioned earlier Austin that you know restrictions and rules are different everywhere and Australia has some of the most strict quarantine uh requirements and and things right now so even if they're still there in 2022 you know we'll be in a position we can go for long enough that that we can manage that but yeah I think I I've, I've just always thought 2022 for for Big travel and in but even in person astrology conferences as well as other big events as well. Um, it, not that you know everywhere in the world will wait until then because I think there'll be some places that might open up sooner. But as a general, maybe more countries are moving in that direction. That's that's what twenty twenty two feels like. Yeah, yeah. That makes well, sense and too. if you're going to plan like a big international thing, then you know it it matters whether the Europeans and Australians can come even if it's held in the United States. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And that I don't think that's going to happen in 2021. But yeah. that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get, get there. Some, what was it, the 28th making, of December? <laughs> we're making progress at least. Maybe that's a good theme or a good yes. um, keyword is, is making progress this year in 2021. Heading in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. That's a good one. You know, I mean, yeah, just and as a um, – sort of a summation or looking back at 2021, you know, um, it's really, a, it's very patchwork, right? It's very mm. mixed bag. Like there are mouse traps in the bag and some months when you reach in, your fingers will get snapped. Um, there are also valuable jewels. Uh, there are pearls, the bat- Jupiter and Pisces mm. will provide some of the bounty of the sea. Yes. Um, there's some, you know, there, there are some, <sighs> Um, some of the bad moments are pretty bad, right? They're not quite, but pretty, you know, like rivaling some 2020 bad moments, but they're intercut and balanced out with like legitimately nice configurations. And part of what made 2020 so difficult was that it was, you know, it was sort of like nine months of horror and three months of, I guess this is not terrible, but not necessarily like actively improving things. There were no um, jewels like the, in the bag in 2020. Yeah, or very few. Like there was like a week here and there. Um, you know, because uh, good is not just things don't get worse, right? Oh, no. Good <laughs> to me is that, things are actively improving. Like exactly. not getting worse is just neutral. Yeah. Um, and so – you know the 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 proportion and ratio in 2020 was very off whereas 2021 i think has a a much more a much more equivalent ratio it's a little bit more fair it's not just one thing after another mm-hmm. yeah and there's more occasional like goodies in the bag uh in the Hall- halloween tr- treat bag metaphorically of the year than compared to last year last year was just yeah, like not- when Somebody's giving out like toothpaste or something for Halloween. Yeah, not every piece of candy has a razor blade hidden in it this year. <laughs> right. Okay. That's good. Um, awesome. I think we we did it then, guys. Uh, are there any other final thoughts about 2021 that we need to mention before we wrap up? Um, I know, you know, this this has been a monumental year in 2020. So and I'm glad that we did the forecast last year and prepared for it as much as we did and that we're doing that again this year. I'm trying to think if there's any major things. You know, we're always looking at these things archetypally and looking at the movements of the planets and trying to describe what that means as an archetype and anticipate some of these things based on where things are headed now, where that might head in the future. But it's always interesting to see how the specifics actually play out over the course of the next 12 months once we get there. Um, so hopefully we came up with a few good, not just catchy, but poignant one-liners, uh, similarly to how we did last year in terms of the no-hugging <clears throat> March, no-hugging c- configurations in March. We've got some aggressive hugging happening this year. Um, are there any other, any other themes or any other keywords that stand out to you as our main themes of the year? 
I can't remember them now, but I know there's a few that came up as we went along. Yeah. I mean, the uh, assembly, pe- yes. People, people in the chat are the, the assembly of planets in February, that big lineup of planets that happens in uh, Aquarius. That's a good one. Um, there was Mars being the farting part of that, uh, which is kind of ruining the party a little bit, or at least attempting to cause some disruptions in the square. Um, Kelly, you were mentioning like the Jupiter and Pisces like preview when it dips in being more. Um, I guess that was part of the aggressive hugging. I was thinking aggressive in terms yeah, of Mars. Yeah, I mean, I but... think that Jupiter and Pisces does not hug aggressively. I think that was very yeah. like Mars in Cancer or something. Maybe yeah. the combination of the two. But... Jupiter in Pisces enfolds you. It does. It, it envelops you and it brings you in, and it, like, and as a result of that, you feel inspired or uplifted. But I don't have any catchy phrases. I think Austin, you said jewels of the sea or something. Which um, <laughs> I, I I just keep hearing in a pirate uh, voice the bounty of the sea. <laughs> um, there's actually a, there's a recipe in the Pegatrix for a Jupiter in the first decan of Pisces talisman for miraculous uh, miraculous excellence at fishing that you will gather the fish together and I just hear bounty of the sea bounty of the sea that's, yeah it's probably because I just watched the lighthouse last week so. I just hear Willem Dafoe talking about the bounty of the sea. Love it. I love it. Um, all right, guys. Thank you so much for doing this uh, this year. Speaking of this year, what do you guys have going on? Kelly, uh, what are you doing in 2021 for those listening to this either now or in the future? Yeah, absolutely. I will be continuing to teach online. I have my Become an Astrologer training program, which is available. You can start anytime and move through the training. Plus, I'll have a variety of live classes. In addition, I'll be focusing more on my monthly astrology guide, which is a Patreon style subscription, but you don't sign up on Patreon, you sign up on my website. And if you just go to my website, kellysastrology.com and check out uh, your astrology guide monthly, there's uh, some exclusive videos and special subscriber only content that I create there. So that uh, has been going for a couple of years, but we're looking to take it to a new level in 2021. So that's me. And your website is kellysastrology.com. Yes. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, Austin, what do you have going on? Well, I'm going to be teaching yearly classes again, and that will probably be announced in early February. Classes are going to be um, April through November, as they were this year. I'm going to get some books done, and um, Kate and I have plenty of nefarious plans uh, for Sphere and Sundry. We're already eyeing a number of elections. There'll be a number of uh, strange and miraculous offerings. I love it. Um, and your website is austincopic.com and Caitlin's is spherensundry.com. Yep. Excellent. Uh, so people should check those out. Uh, as for myself, um, I put posters out. So most of the graphics used in this episode, you can get a poster version to put on your wall to look at the astrology of 2021. Um, that's being done through print on demand. You can find those on the astrologypodcast.com website. Lisa and I put out our 2021 auspicious elections report, which is out now, and you can use it to get the uh, electional charts for each of the next 12 months. Um, I want to give a shout out to all the patrons that support the Astrology Podcast and who joined us today for the live recording of this. It's awesome to have people join us live for these episodes and actually always contribute something. And sometimes we go in directions we wouldn't have gone otherwise. Um, We've also been able to improve. Our technical setup this year and Austin's nice looking new camera is as a result of that. So, thanks to the patrons for supporting that. And we're going to get Kelly get set up on a new one very soon as well. So, we keep doing this. One of the things we also put the Patreon towards is starting to do transcripts. So, I've actually paying somebody to do transcripts of the Astrology Podcast episodes to make them more accessible, both to people with different languages as well as people with um, disabilities that can't hear. Uh, the podcast episodes. So you can support that effort and also get access to new episodes ahead of time and other bonus content uh, through our page on Patreon. So I think that's it. I'm going to keep doing the Astrology Podcast, and we'll be back again 
for the next forecast, which I think at one one point will be the forecast for February, which we'll record and release sometime in early January. Um, but I think that's it for this episode of the Astrology Podcast. So thanks a lot, guys, for joining me for this today. Anytime. Thanks for having us or having me. Yeah, thank you. All right. And thanks, everyone, for listening to this episode. Uh, please be sure to like and subscribe, and good luck in 2021. Let us know how it goes, and we'll be back again in a year to look at the forecast for 2022. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on Patreon. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Nate Craddock, Marin Altman, Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Michelle Marillot, Christy Moe, Ariana Amore, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, and Nadia Habhab. For more information about how to become a patron or have your name listed in the credits, please visit patreon.com slash astrology podcast. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Northwest Astrological Conference, which is happening online May 27th through the 31st, 2021. Find out more information at norwac.net. The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which you can find out more information about at mountainastrologer.com. The ISAR Astrology Conference, happening August 18th through the 22nd, 2021. More information at isar2020.org. The Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, which you can find out more information about at honeycomb.co. Also, the Portland School of Astrology. More information at portlandastrology.org. The Astro Gold Astrology app, available for both iPhone and Android, available at astrogold.io. And finally, the primary software program that we use on episodes of the Astrology Podcast is called Solar Fire Astrology Software, which is available at alabe.com. And you can get a 15% discount with the promo code AP15.